and fix policy? I will say we every day sort of work around it on an administration and policy level, right? Like if you've got an outside warrant, we'll call up the prosecutor, we'll call up, you know, and that, that works to a point. It's very labor intensive. It depends how many warrants they have. If it's, if it's Snohomish County, easy, because we know each other. If it's, you know, a Soton County, that would be an introduction and maybe harder because, you know, it, it, so I think it can be worked around case by case. My sense is it's probably a legislative fix. It depends. It depends how much we want to. Okay, so the, the Blake fix that just passed, right? Mandatory deferral. Tribal, tribal programs could be on that, right? If we have a tribal member who gets caught in King County with possession, they could come to our drug court. Now, the county prosecutor could allow it, but we've actually, we had a situation where we had an individual who was um, drug court eligible in Pierce County, uh, back, this was back when it was a felony, um, and also had a case with us, and we couldn't legally figure, they wanted to send us the case, we couldn't legally figure out a way to do it because they weren't able to do bench probation. So <clears throat> I guess that's a long way of saying, I think there's a legislative fix out there that would at least make our lives easier, but at the end of the day, it's probably gonna be us talking to each other and figuring out if there's a forum, a way to make communication between prosecutors and courts um, across tribal and state lines easier. And I guess this is the, the point that we would open it up to the audience, um, you know, whether you're a uh, law enforcement officer off the tribal reservation or a tribal officer on the reservation, uh, we wanna hear from, from you, uh, the work that you do for your community and, and we want to hear about the barriers that you face. And so at this point, we'd kind of open it up uh, before we might ask more questions. But we want to really give the audience uh, the opportunity to be engaged with the conversation and the solutions. We do have also uh, legislators in here. And I'll, Deborah, thank you for, Representative Lakenoff, thank you for being here. And again, that just goes to show the, the richness of the conversation. We have uh, County Council Member Buchanan from Whatcom County as well, and I know I made a few comments about how in Lummi we did the 1092, we're doing the county's uh, work when we enforce RCWs in the county, but our officers are, are working three times harder, and we're, we're starting to lose our officers because of that burnout. And we do need to work together, so I'd, I'd ask maybe if you might have any responses or thoughts on things that we can work on, but. I do want to open it up to the audience and see if there's anyone that has any comments or wants to ask questions on behalf of your community or your tribe or organization. Mike will be coming to you in just this. Hey, Shaba. You got me? Hey, Shaba and Hotch the Hill, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Peters, and I'm the chairman of the Squawks Island Tribe. I, uh, had 20 years of law enforcement, started out as a reserve at 21 years old, um, became a police officer, was a fish and wildlife officer, police sergeant, and then a police chief for four years, and for four years on the Washington Association of Police Chiefs uh, before becoming the chairman. Um, so I have a lot of experience with this, and in the early 2000s, I watched this epidemic take hold of my community and watched it tear us apart. Um, and a couple things I've learned. One is I, I'm fearful of legislative fixes. Uh, we have a tendency to go from one extreme to the other, and we have a hard time with finding middle ground. Um, I understand why folks want to decriminalize uh, possession. Um, that's because we went to an extreme. We were filling our jails and prisons with people who were users, and disproportionately, people of color were filling those jails and prisons. And that wasn't right. Those are facts. So we go to the other side of it where we decriminalize everything and then um, we're still not helping people. Um, criminalization is happening on the streets. I know a lot of people who have thanked me for taking them to jail 10 times because they needed that time to detox. They needed that time to get a wake up call. They needed to hit rock bottom. Um, also, it stops the victimization sometimes that occurs by some of our users. It's just a fact it happens. And so we need to be there. Our cops on the streets need that tool to intercept and stop things from happening in the moment at 3 o'clock in the morning when the rest of us are asleep in bed. That way, that way is so many different ways, not just your food, but your spirituality, um, your teachings and your ancestral um, oral teachings and stories and song talents and drumming and, and um, 
All those things make this person. That's what I am, I'm all those things. And if I was uprooted for something I did wrong, besides li living with the guilt, I would, I would start to disintegrate. You lose your identity. But for the law enforcement, I wanted to just say the same thing, you know, that we've had fires all around us. A house fire, the whole thing burned up. Nobody investigate why. Same property, two more trailers burned up. One actually blew up. And we have all these fires going on, but we don't have anybody saying, why are they burning up? And it's because there's people making drugs on the reservation. And when we say trafficking, we're not just talking about drugs, we're talking about our young people that are addicted. They're selling themselves so that they can have their drug. And why can't they be picked up if, they're, if they have that appearance of being drugged, like you heard the word zombie? Why can't they be picked up if they got drugs on, pasted on their face and they're going in a store? Or they're bent over? You know, all these things. Um, it's really awful for our children to have to witness that. We've never had to witness that before. Now it's common. It's very common to see those things happening. And so I just wonder, like law enforcement, when they have an overdose, which we have plenty of our share um, in Skokomish, why can't law enforcement or social worker or somebody follow up on it and, and um, and follow the, the one that overdosed and say, where did you get that? Can that be documented? Can we find a source? Can they help us find a source? Can a statement be made? You know, I always wonder why, don't, why doesn't somebody talk to the one that's in the hospital? Maybe they'll tell where they're getting their, their drug. And so I just, I just know we have to do something, and it's getting worse. And I just want to be here and try to learn what I can to bring back to our tribe. I, I want legal action. I want our traditional acts, a, action, our spiritual. Nobody talks about spiritual. Nobody talks about how the natives, Indian people, have to feed their Indian. You know, that's so many things that... Um, that is being lost and instead of natives capturing their young, they're being captured by outsiders. The outside's coming in and we're in a whole different kind of war. And so I hope that we can find a way to make the, like searching a car, you know, we. I give a license number, I say, that car is always over there. I give them a picture, I give them their license plate, I show the person, and I was wishing that they could um, do a search. They'd find drugs. I tell them what time they come. And then I say, oh, our hands are tied, we can't just do that, we have to have cause or something. Well. I think all the deaths we're seeing is cause enough. We need to do a little more. I, I really appreciate that, that um, comment. <laughs> so I know, I know we have a few in line, um, and so as you're ra raising your hand, um, I, I do have a few other questions as well, but I wanna make sure, you know, for our law enforcement that's up here, uh, not just up here, but if you're law enforcement in the audience too, and you can respond to any of our questions from our, our relative here, that's a frustration from so many in our all of our communities, is why can't law enforcement do more? Um, you know, when I talk with our law enforcement, we come out of a public health emergency where the county will only take violent offenses, or uh, mandatory holds or federal holds. Um, Drug dealing and drug deliveries are not considered a violent offense. I think we need to change that. 
so that drug offenses are violent offenses and they do get holds. I know that we're out, we're, as we're getting out of the, the public health emergency, maybe things will open up more, but we need to also learn from these last two years and the barriers that it presented. And so I do hope our law enforcement, both up here and in the audience, can answer uh, some of the questions and, and help all of us understand uh, some of those things. So I want to make sure as you do ask questions, uh, I want to make sure they get answered here as well in, in the conversation. So I, you all deserve that for being here. So, so I wanted to address the, uh, the, I guess, the interdiction as well as hammering those who are trafficking. That was a comment from the crowd. And I wanted to bring up our drug task force. Here in Whatcom County, we have a model in uh, collaboration, and that's our drug task force. They work with federal agencies and all the uh, cities, the agencies within the cities to uh, stop trafficking of, of drugs. Now I knew that this question was going to come up and because of that I, I asked someone to come here today who's an expert in that, who's been working in the field in the drug task force and that's Under Sheriff Doug Chadwick. He works for the county. He can actually answer, answer a number of questions that have been uh, posed today such as what's going on with booking restrictions in our jail and how to get people in, uh, who are delivering drugs uh, into the jail. And anyway, uh, Doug, would you mind commenting on some of these, these questions such as uh, what's going on with the drug task force and maybe can Lummi be involved in the drug task force? Well, good afternoon. Again, my name is Doug Chowduck. I'm the undersheriff with the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office. I've been with the Sheriff's Office since 1995 and have enjoyed a, a long relationship with uh, Lummi Tribal Police over the years. Up until 2020, we had um, concurrent jurisdiction, for those of you that don't know, and they already talked about some of the jurisdictional challenges. Uh, Sheriff's Office, up to that time, had jurisdiction over non-tribal members, but no jurisdiction over tribal. Uh, the interlocal that we signed with um, the Lummi Nation in 2020 allowed them, gave them general authority law enforcement um, so that they could actually address crimes being committed by non-tribal people. I certainly understand what um, Chairman Lewis said about the, uh, what that does to your resources. So I am happy to, you know, if Chief Martin wants to reach out and, and have a discussion about how we can do better, um, because again, we're all in the same boat when it comes to this opioid crisis and fentanyl and what it's doing to our communities. It's uh, across the nation, across the state, and it, it reaches the far corners of, of every corner of Whatcom County to include the Lummi Nation. So the other thing that uh, Prosecutor Ritchie mentioned is the Whatcom County Sheriff's oversees the Whatcom Gang Drug Task Force. And we focus on mid to upper level organizations that are trafficking drugs into our communities and essentially profiting off other people's addiction. And we work very closely with our state and federal partners to stem the flow of these dangerous drugs to our community. Um, I was actually an investigator with the Drug Task Force back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and as the speaker mentioned earlier, we were just on the, the front edge of the opioid crisis with the, the prescription pills, and then we saw the transition to heroin, and now we've seen the counterfeit pills that are laced with fentanyl, which are um, killing more and more people throughout our communities. So it's imperative that we continue to, as the prosecutor said, aggressively pursue and prosecute people that are, are profiting and, and taking advantage of the most vulnerable in our communities. So, and the other thing, back, back in the day, we did have a member of uh, the Lummi Nation Police Department on the task force, and I think m now may be a time to have that conversation again and would certainly welcome that collaboration and that partnership to try and address this uh, fentanyl epidemic that is, is affecting all our communities. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief Batiste. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, I just want to echo some of the Sheriff's comments. Uh, it's great to be here. Again, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, the comment and the feedback to law enforcement is invaluable. I appreciate the Lieutenant's comments about the complexities of uh, what law enforcement has to do. Uh, Chief, you know that very well, uh, as well with the uh, tulalips. So when particularly state agencies, uh, even locals, when we respond to something on the reservation, it's about knowing the law because it's complex. you got to enforce state law. Can you enforce federal law? What does the tribe want in terms of laws that uh, they're asking you to enforce? So it's pretty complex in terms of what we get to do and when we get to do it. And one example is for us, uh, anyone here from the Yakimas? 
we put together great working with you. So as an example, we put together a retrocession agreement with the Yakimas. Uh, and in order to get the law enforcement component of that accomplished, we had to sit down and work things out with regards to a common understanding as to, as a state law enforcement agency, what can we actually do on the reservation? So we had a federal prosecutor teach us, teach my people what is it that they could do. But we also wanted to know what is it that the tribe expected of us from the standpoint of a mutual aid. So we had dialogue about that as well. And then we shared from a state perspective, what can we enforce? Because we only get to enforce revised Court of Washington laws. That's it for us. So it's those common understandings that needs to be hammered out. And then there is a need for an agreement. And our federal and state prosecutors get to help marshal us through those things. And that insight is greatly appreciated because there's liability associated with what our troopers go out and do that concerns them. And now there's you know, issues of certification. They don't want to lose their certification. So they want to make sure that when they're doing something that they're within bounds in terms of agency policy and the training that we provide them with the help of our federal and state prosecutors and our tribal partners. So it's all about, again, when we talk about partnerships, it's truly about sitting down and hammering out uh, understandings that will allow you to arrive at a, a common place where you can uh, effectively support one another. Uh, in terms of the troops who, if you ran across a trooper with a holier than our attitude, that's not a trooper. We don't allow that. The district commander is responsible for ensuring that policy that is set at my level and down through the chain of command is adhered to. So it sounds like more of a personality thing. But in terms of somebody uh, exercising, uh, saying they're not going to work with locals or not going to work with the tribe, that's totally unacceptable. We are a partnering agency, and if you run across something like that, any of you, I want to know about it. That's unacceptable, uh, and that could be easily taken care of. You get to wear the badge and the patch because you're going to do what uh, we say when it, when it comes to setting policy, and you do it in a way that we do it is service with humility. That's the only way to get it done. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Um, and, and so uh, you brought up a great point, and I want to pass the mic over to uh, the Yakima Nation. Uh, they've gone through the retro session. Um, you know, Washington State is one of those states where it's a, we're a public law 280 state. Um, you know, and, and so it, when you talk about jurisdiction, it's pretty complex, uh, real quick. And, and so, uh, so the Yakima Nation has gone through the retro session. I was on council when that happened, and it was a long process. Um, and we worked closely with um, our public safety uh, commissioner, uh, Chief Shike, and, and so um, if we have Chief Shike kind of like talk about that, how, how it was before retrocession with that authority and after, um, because that's, you know, again, the, the, we're looking at all options. Uh, is, is retrocession for good for all tribes when they, when they have that authority back, or, or is it good or bad? And so uh, I think Chief Shike, with his experience, um, can probably maybe uh, share some thoughts. Jimmy. Thank you, Asa. I'm Jimmy Shike. I'm the commissioner for Yakima Nation. And the first thing I want to talk about um, is communication as far as drugs goes. I can tell you my leadership, they have government to government meetings. Um, for example, the leadership they'll meet with like Chief Patisse from the State Patrol on an MOU. They met with our sheriff from the county. They met with our U.S. Attorney's Office, FBI. So in return, that helps me do my job better because I have better communication with our partners. And you got to have that. You, you just got to have those partnerships in law enforcement. Um, we're fortunate up in Yakima that we get along with everybody we work with. They're just the ones I mentioned. Um, even our U.S. Attorney's Office, they've even lowered amounts on drugs just so they can prosecute some of these bad guys. Um, it, it's, I mean, I'm proud of that because there's not a set number. Sometimes you get stuck on, you have to have that certain amount, not up in Yakima. So I, I just want to mention that. Tom Hanlon is one of the main U.S. attorneys that I work with, and um, we actually communicate. So I just want to share that, you know, communication is big. Um, talking back, getting switching gears here to retrocession. Uh, retrocession for us happened in 2016 where we got exclusive jurisdiction back on our tribal membership. Um, prior to that, for example, state patrol would take our tribal members and charge them for DUI. Now they have to call one of my officers and we take care of that. 
Um, but again, you know, um, it's just communication. That's just one good example. Um, as far as jurisdiction goes, we have the most complex jurisdiction ever. You have to know everything like they mentioned up there, land status, enrollment status. Um, even to this day, we still deal with deeded property. We could have a murder of a tribal member, and if it's on deeded property, they'll go to the state. Um, but the one thing I can tell you, though, that our actual U.S. Attorney's Office and the sheriffs will, will sit down and we'll actually discuss that at the crime scene. And there's actually been times where we've had homicides where we've um, let the sheriff's office take it, but we ended up doing some more research and it came back to us as the, the feds and the, and the tribe. Um, so it, it works pretty good where, where we're at. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the council lady, which she talked about holding some of these people um, up in Yakima. One of the bad things that I can tell you, Barry, is that we have a small jail. We can't, we can only house people for federal or felony crimes or your major crimes. We can't house them for being under the, you know, influence of drugs. Um, it gets tough, you know, because like you said, we, we deal with the same thing, homelessness. Um, it's, it's really bad over in our home, but you can't just take them to jail. We have to hold them for, we have to have room for all our other cases like domestic violence, stabbings, shootings. Um, so... That's one of our biggest barriers. Thank you. Uh, apologize if I'm a little nervous. There's a lot of powerhouses inside here and uh, got my chief up there staring at me. So, um, Detective Sergeant Zoller with the Toledo Police Department. Um, I've, uh, I'm at nine years right now working on my 10th year. Um, I've been a part of our drug task force. It's the internal drug task force. I understand it's not like Whatcom County, uh, how you have different agencies and whatnot. It's just all, all of our internal. And I, I felt like I should probably give you guys insight of like our struggles as well and how we've combated, uh, com combated some struggles that you guys have had also. Um, so I've been a part of it for five years and then I've been on patrol for four. Uh, so one of the biggest things that we have had that when I first started with the tribal agency, I haven't been with any other agency whatsoever, no state agencies. And uh, I feel like one of the biggest stigmas that we had is like, oh, you're a tribal cop. And uh, it's like I didn't know enough about uh, education in regards to like state law and whatnot, but our jurisdiction is tribal, state, and federal. Um, I feel like as a tribal police officer right now, working with Tulalip, that we have to be the most educated person out of all the officers, because I'm, I'm falling into three different courts. I'm not falling into two courts or one court. I have to know that. So in order for me to um, do my job effectively, I need to start building relationships. So when I first started with the drug task force, um, I understood that what are my barriers um, that I have as an officer, right? Uh, it's in my relationships with the county, my relationships with the feds, uh, my relationships with the tribal police officers as well. Um, so, and the only way that I could really go ahead and uh, combat that is, hey, come meet me, come look at me and see me as a person who starts talking on the cell phone. So I've actually had uh, many um, sit downs with Brian up there, and I don't know how many times I've been in your office, and we've, uh, we've gone over many discussions on how can we combat the drugs on the reservation, right? And we work through our solutions, we find our problems and find solutions, as well with the feds. I've had sit downs with the feds, we have uh, meetings now every, uh, every month we have a meeting. And then with the county, we've actually had a lot of training with our county, or with our county guys. And I feel like the relationship has gotten a lot better, right? Um, one of the barriers to combat um, the, the drugs on the reservation, right, is uh, actually when we first started, our chief uh, opened up the flood rates with training. And our training was just with everybody, whether it was a, a regional team or going down to Seattle and dealing with the Rylea team down there, uh, working with the Wacom team. Um, we're all working through problems together and learning different ways to, if I have a problem, I have a solution on top of that. So uh, the education in your officers is always going to be a huge, huge uh, tool in order to combat any problems that you have. Through the state, we try to stay within state jurisdictions in Tulalip, and the reason why, whether it falls into a tribal court or a federal court, I know I'll be good in all three of all three courts, right? So if I'm most restrictive in the state court and I'm and I'm following my jurisdiction, or whatever, nobody can really tell me no.
who have been part of these drug task forces for years, got a lot of funding um, from the, the JAG funds. And so uh, back in those days, they had a, a sergeant that was assigned to the drug task force, and they were the supervisor or sergeant for the task force. Our task force has not had a uh, state trooper assigned for over 16, 17 years. And so my question is, those partnerships that we had with the state in the past, will we see those partnerships continue in the near future? Um, and, and I know the struggles. We have the same struggles of trying to find bodies, right? We're just like every law enforcement agency out here. We're down three in my dispatch center, seven in patrol, one detective. We struggle just like everybody else, but I'm hoping that we can find that relationship between the tribes and the state again in a partnership. So if you could speak to that, yeah, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Great question. So it all uh, dates back to funding available. As you know, the, uh, the, the burn jag has ebbed and flowed with regards to money coming to the state. And uh, along with that, we have issues with uh, shortages of personnel. So of the 21 task forces that used to exist within the state, we were a part of 19 of those. I only have eight people now that are within task forces, drug task forces throughout the state. I'm 257 people short. Uh, that's troopers that I need. So I'm, I'm, I'm recruiting. If you know anybody who wants to be a trooper, I'm the chief recruiter at, the, at that as well. But again, yeah, in the future, when we get ourselves better positioned, and the funding is there. I mean, there was a time when in order for a task force to actually function, it has to ha had to have a WSP sergeant uh, in charge of that task force. But again, funding shortages uh, came into play as well as personnel shortages. So we're trying to work ourselves back towards that direction, but I can't give any immediacy because we're a long ways out. I have 43 uh, troopers that will graduate Wednesday and I'll still be over 200 folks down. So we're trying to get there, slowly but surely. You're one of every chief practically around the state that's asked me that question, so I appreciate the question. But the answer is we're working towards it. Okay, thank you. Um, and I know the, the mic's gonna go, go around a few more times. Um, Robert Little, can you raise your hand? So I just wanna let everybody know uh, Robert Little is helping us with track the conversation. Can you raise your hand again? So, in case we do run out of time, um, we, we are having all of these sessions scribed, so all of your comments, they're not falling on deaf ears. Uh, we are tracking them, and I wanna make sure that if we do run out of time and listening to, to all the comments you have, please uh, come out and talk with Robert to make sure we can capture your comments and write them down. Uh, we will make sure that we have them in the next session as well, where we can continue this conversation. I just wanted to make that, that comment so everybody knows if you do raise your hand and you don't get opportunity to speak and you can't come to the next session where we talk, continue the talks and get to solutions, please uh, talk with Robert. I just wanted to make that comment. We'll go back to the mic. Hello. I'm, I'm, I'm going to work my way up front here. So nobody, I was standing way in the back, so I don't want everybody turning their heads. I'm going to, so everybody can kind of see me up front. Um, my name is Gary James. I'm now the director of security here at the Silver Reef Casino. Um, but my previous life, I did 28 years of law enforcement uh, for here at Lummi. And one of the things I really, really cherished when I was chief of police was relationships. And we had those all over. Us. Is one question I got for the chief of Toledo is Nadio still going? Do you know anything about Nadio? Native American, Native American Tribal Enforcement Officers Association. No, no, it's not still going. That was, that's one of the ones that I used. There was actually eight of us, I think, that was Tulalip, Lummi, Nooksack, um, and a few other tribes that we used each other as resources. And, um, and if we couldn't do it by ourselves, we kind of counted on each other, and we met once a month to, to kind of gather our resources. And, but to, going on to Under Sheriff Chadwick's comments, uh, we were part of the task force when I was chief of police, and we did get some things done. And I'm thankful because, you know, it's not only the tribes, it's everybody around us that's suffering as well. So if we can't work together to make it happen, 
we're kind of left by ourselves. And what I would like to see is some of these relationships being dusted off and redeveloped again. I think uh, Nadia was actually working on a regional jail facility at one point. And I think Tulalip had property set aside and uh, we we're going to do that. Um, I'm not sure where that, you know, as politics and, and everybody else moves on in their careers, I'm not sure what happened with, with all that. But what I'm asking is that we take a look at some of this stuff that has been done in the past and maybe dust it off and see what, you know, because some of the stuff was working. It really was. I mean, we, I think it was my second year in as chief of police, we went to the FBI and asked for help. And they said, well, you don't meet our threshold. Some of the stuff that is um, being dealt at that particular time, which is 2002, 2003, doesn't meet our threshold. And I says, it doesn't meet yours, but it certainly meets mine. I says, it is hurting my community. Please help. And they ended up signing an agent to us for, I think, two years to do um, investigations and helped us out and got some of the major drug dealers off of our streets. Didn't solve all the problems, but it's some of those little things that you do that can certainly make a difference. And putting, you know, the, <coughs> excuse me, putting some of the jurisdictional issues aside, you know, on both, on both sides. I worked with Sheriff Elfo for years. I almost consider him a mentor because he was really, really good to me when I was chief of police. Him and there's a group of eight of them there in Whatcom County that really treated me well and taught me a lot about relationships and how our politics can be different, but we can still get along because we all have some of the same problems. And I know um, Nick wanted me to speak on what we're seeing here at the casino. And we are seeing quite a bit of the drugs that everybody's seeing on the street here. And we have our own little um, ways to deal with that. You're caught with drugs, we don't, they don't go to court, they just get banned from here for five years and they're allowed to come back. But where do they go after that? You know, so that's, you know, all I can do is protect what I got here and protect the tribe's assets here. And I see when the, we call the tribal police, um, the new agreement is all well and good I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I know the new agreement's all well and good, but do they have the resources in place to handle that? And there's certainly, the people that are employed there certainly have the intelligence to do that. They're the best cops I think I've known in my life. There's two of them sitting right up there. I hired them both, so I know they're good. But they need, we all think, and I think we all need it, you know, all these resources. And that's what it's going to take and working together and if we're short on a resource let's figure out how we can work together to make it happen because we're all suffering um i think that's that's all i really have to say thank you uh, hearing uh, your your comments and, and i think we had a few others that had their hand raised in the audience was that some in the back and i know over here nick Hobie. okay Sorry, it's kind of hard to see that that light is really bright uh, down here. So <laughs> I'm uh, really counting on the, the mic. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Dina. Uh, my name is Diakowa. I'm from Lummi. Um, and I know a few faces in here um, from law enforcement. And you guys might know me from 13 years ago uh, when I wasn't in recovery. And I know that jail works i'm a living testimony of that um so listening to the blake the blake law 2021 it goes way back before that it goes back 13 years ago when i was in addiction um, and i stood in front of the judge and pled guilty 13 times and that was one jurisdiction of bellingham um, so it goes way back to the system um, and what works for the system. I'm a little bit nervous. I haven't shared my story, um, and, but I'm sharing it today. Um, I know one of you two are a prosecutor before, weren't you? <laughs> that gentleman right there 
saved mine and my husband's family's life back in Superior Court, and you probably don't remember us. We remember you. Um, and we'd never forget a face that um, has done that justice you've done for our family. Um, Ray remembers me. I know um, Ralph remembers me, and I'm glad they get to see us today doing and being productive community members uh, here in Lummi. But I just had to share um, that teeth that we are talking about when you guys do the Blake Law and you take the teeth away from law enforcement. Um, that isn't good when people are suffering, especially in fentanyl. Um, back when, in our day, uh, the jail didn't have room for, for criminals back then, so they just booked and released uh, people that were doing misdemeanors um, until it caught up to them and they ended up doing some time in jail until it went to a felony, such as what happened to us. Um, and he took a plea deal so I could go home with my kids and the prosecutor was nice enough to let me do home arrest, which is never usually a done deal for a felony. Usually do jail time for that. And I think it was this lady here that granted that. And we never forget it. So there is ways of working the system in a good way if we come together um, and share our story. Um, these jurisdictions I keep hearing, funding, laws, codes, all that stuff, it's been going way back from a long time ago. It's time for us to really sit down and um, get busy. That jail's old. Need a new jail for Bellingham. It's been said for how many years now? Um, and our people are there at Whatcom County Jail. We had two overdoses in those jails of our community members uh, due to not getting proper treatment. Um, so that's something that we're trying to work on, you know, with detox. Uh, getting them their medical detox before you drop them off to jail. Get them the proper treatment, you know, of a involuntary system before you just go arrest them and let them suffer in jail without any medication or what they need, their needs. They might have mental health. You know, they, fentanyl's a whole different game from back in our day. Um, I didn't really know what I was gonna say, but I know I had to say something from the bottom of my heart because I recognize a few people in here. And today I have 13 years off the drug of my choice of doing good. I know this guy right here on console, <laughs> run and gun with him back in the day. I know people that, you know, that we, we, re, we recover. And um, when you, you know, there's ways of just making sure you don't take away that bottom for people that are recovering, such as jail. You know, whether it's, you know, your kids getting taken away, you know, that those are eye-openers for people. They need that because we don't see, we're blind, we're deaf. We're not gonna hear anything until you wake up in the jail cell and say, holy smokes, did I do that? I can't believe that was me. I can't believe that I racked up all those charges. I brought tears to my eyes when I seen that um, in front of me and that's not who I was. That wasn't who I was raised to be. And that's what addiction will do to you. And you need that eye opener um, to, to wake up and, and realize and to have people like these prosecutors aren't, to me, you know, a lot of people think that prosecutors are bad people, but they're not. You know, they're doing their job and they're making sure that we're safe. Um, and that's, you know, something that I'll never forget. And I just wanted to share that because we recognized you guys sitting here. And so I just wanted to really thank you guys for, for doing that. Um, and here we are sitting today. And, but I just wanted to get up and share it. It sounds like we have a lot of work to do. Um, going with jurisdictions and codes and, you know, it's not about all that. It's about keeping our communities safe, our future generations safe, our families safe. Um, 
and everything else that comes along with your guys' territory. I get the law and justice. Been there, done it. Um, so it feels good to know that I have, I don't even have a driving ticket since, you know, my record's been super clean um, since I've been in recovery. So that's something to be proud of and to know that I caused that wreckage. That wreckage is gonna catch up to you once you wake up. And that's a good thing because you owe back to your community after what you took from them, regardless if you were not in your right mind or state of mind. You still got to give back because you made those choices. Um, so I just wanted to share that with everybody and thank you. Hi everybody, um, my name's Josh Bagley. I'm vice chairman of the Suquamish tribe. And I wasn't really gonna say anything, but Deanna, inspired me so um and i'm i haven't counted the years but i've been clean and sober for probably 14 15 years now so and i i understand jail does work but i'm on the social justice side of these people are sick or you know and if somebody's sick i like i said i understand jail works but i just have to say that these people are sick and throwing our people in jail when they're sick is really hard for me. So I just, that's where I come from too. Like I said, I understand it works, but like everybody said, we have a lot of work to do, a, a, a lot of work to do because like I said, we don't want to be throwing our sick people in jail to get them better. There, there has to be other options. So thank you. Good afternoon, um, Jennifer LaPointe, General Manager, Swinomish. And I just have a, a different kind of question. I think going back, it's really hard to follow that, by the way. Thank you for, for speaking. But um, I wanted to go back to the question or the thoughts about the staffing issues. And, you know, it's one thing to talk about the jurisdiction issues and all these things that we know have been going on for years and years and years. Swinomish has some of those things worked out. We're doing okay in that realm, but we all know no matter what we work out there, we, there just is not enough people out there to hire as officers. So we can decide what they can enforce, what, who they can arrest, but we just literally don't have enough people to do the work. And I think everybody in here is probably in that situation. And there's not a light at the end of the tunnel. When you're telling me you're still 200 short, I mean, that's not something that we're just gonna fix overnight. So I would like to see um, something documented out of this to just talk about what's the long-term plan there uh, to make sure that we don't stay in this problem forever. We, I meet with our chief of police at least once a week um, talking about the staffing issues. We can have all the cross jurisdiction, we can have all the authority in our reservation boundary, but we literally have one officer on duty a lot. So Nick, I heard you saying one officer goes in that house alone. We have one officer in our whole like entire reservation alone and they're going in the house alone and they're waiting for somebody to come from Anacortes or Mount Vernon if something goes wrong. So that is, and if they call out, then we're like, oh, what do we do now? <laughs> So uh, I want to apologize on behalf of Chief Cowan. He was supposed to be here today, but he's in Everett because we have one officer on today. They had to go down there and take care of some business. So we're, we're making do, but all the dealers on our reservation, the people trafficking drugs on our reservation, they know we only have one or two officers on duty all the time. Everybody knows it. So if they're at the casino, they're not in the village. If they're in the village, they're not at the casino. So I, I don't think this is something we can solve overnight, but I do think it deserves a, like a little bit more conversation about what's our short-term plan and what's our long-term plan because there's, we're not in the same situation as we were maybe like years ago when every little kid wanted to be a police officer. People hear all the things, you know, even the kids, they hear the 
way that police are kind of addressed these days, and it's not their future dream job all the time anymore. So how are we going to fix that? How are our state, how's the state going to support schools and other people to get people into these criminal justice careers? I think we need to start now if we don't want to be sitting here saying we're 500 officers short five years from now. So just saying we're making a plan isn't going to fix it. So thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. Can you hear me? I'm glad you brought that up. It's a serious problem. It is a serious problem. If, did I say it's a serious problem? It is. Not only here, but across the country. And on the other side of the pond for that reason. Everybody is uh, struggling to get people to want to do this work. We've taken an unmerciful beating. That's kind of helped with that. And we have folks in this business that we need to get out of this business. That's hurting us. So it starts with us in terms of cleaning our own house. But uh, I have more folks retiring than I can hire. And they're retiring because their families want them out of this business. That's a shame. It's a shame. My daughter's in this business. You know, and I convinced her to do this. I'm trying to convince your kids and other kids to do this because it's desperately needed. This is a very noble profession. And uh, you, what other job do you get that you can go out and help serve your fellow mankind? This is what this is all about. Uh, we, as a law enforcement population in the state of Washington, is the lowest in the upper 48 per capita. That's all of us, state, federal, local. We need more infusion in all of the ranks of this profession. Uh, but it's hard to find people who want to do this. Plus, we had a mass exodus here, exodus here recently with fire and police retiring. So if we don't figure this out, after I'm long gone from the business, it's going to be, what the heck happened? How did we let that happen? And you, all the cries about, we need more of this and can we do more of that, takes bodies. It takes boots on the ground. Uh, it doesn't happen by magic. In order to cooperate and collaborate, it takes people. And we talk about, well, I can't get so-and-so to do this uh, because they're shorthanded. And they have priorities that are staring them in the face. Prosecutors are in the same boat. He's shorthanded. All of his peers across this state are shorthanded. The AG is probably in the same boat in terms of being able to recruit and retain. It's a problem. So I'm glad you brought it up. I didn't want it to go by without a response. Thank you for bringing it up. Would it be okay? Hello, everybody. I'm Lieutenant Matt Wood with the State Patrol, and I'm the uh, narcotics commander in charge of our drug task force. Um, I'm a 20 year trooper, live in Mason County, work with the wonderful tribes there, the Skomish and the Squaxin, and my sons go to Shelton High School with the children of the tribe. Um, looking at, I don't have a solution. Um, I wish I really did. Um, with our drug task force situation across the state, there are a couple of task forces, especially up in this area, that are, that are fairly well staffed and fairly well supported. Um, but just so you know, most of the task forces out there are hanging on by their fingernails. They are one detective away from folding. Literally one. At the same time, the drug task forces are getting pressured by their city councils to take care of what's considered their high priorities. Their street crimes, their catalytic converter thefts, their bicycle robberies. Um, the things that we all know are drug related, but because we're not getting drug prosecutions, we can get a theft charge. So they're pulling drug detectives out of those spots and having them do street crimes. Um, if we want our drug task forces to be viable, we have to tell our communities that this actually is our priority. Um, we recognize that all of these other crimes are fed by fentanyl. Um, like our very first panel speaker today, reading that wonderful letter from her son, all of his crimes were fed by his need to get his next high. And so, we need to tell our folks that we need to focus on this. We understand the trickle-down effect. 
Um, one of the, for the prosecutors, one of the big struggles that we had um, statewide is when Blake came through, um, most of our, um, backing up a step, for the State Patrol, we have basically two types of drug task forces. We have the ones who are, who are partnered with the DEA, then we have our local uh, jurisdictional task forces. Our DEA ones are still knocking it out of the park um, because they have federal reach. They're, they're grab 100,000 pills at a time. Um, it's not on the news because they're flipping their cases. They're dealing, they're pulling directly out of Mexico. They're setting up buys of 60 pounds, 100 pounds at a time. It, that's, that's every day for them. Um, but our local street task forces, where they used to be able to take our, our addict who had a pocket meth or something like that, a low charge, that nobody really wants to prosecute because that's not what we want. We want them to get help, but we're used to be able to take them and flip them to get their dealer and their dealer, and that's how we built up our, our the chain. Well, as soon as they knew we couldn't arrest them, we just got the big middle finger. Um, they're gonna walk away and, and get their high, and they're, not, they're certainly not gonna give up their dealer um, when they know there's, there's no stick. Um, on this, though, um, we got some detectives who are really starting statewide to work the controlled substance homicide cases. Um, and, if, and if there's an infrastructure in place to where there's certain criteria where you have the overdose death, people treat it as a homicide and not just an addict who, who OD'd and get on to the next one. Having technology, having those types of resources, the detectives can put together a really good homicide case in usually two to three weeks time. And when you do that, you can get a dealer off the street. Um, but we're finding statewide that we're not getting a lot of prosecutor support. It's, it's very, very, very hit and miss. Um, some of them um, are saying, well, you can't prove that, that this was the pill that did it. Well, we got, we got their person who bought with them standing there saying, yeah, that's, we did it together. Nope, that's not good enough. Um, or the technology parts. We got geofence warrants where we have them meeting the dealer right before the OD. No, nope, nope, not good enough. Um, and talking to victims' families, a lot of the prosecutors are trying to plead them out as just a delivery charge. The, the families want these people labeled as murderers. And so often, they'll take a loss in court to get their family story told. That's what they need for their family's closure. But, but going to the different narcotics conferences, there's probably about four counties in the state who are actually pursuing these charges. Most of them, yep. And most of them are just sitting in a prosecutor's inbox until statute of limitations expire, and then they go away quietly because nobody cares about an addict. So um, until we can bridge that gap, flipping informants, I think really working on those controlled substance homicide cases and working the dealer networks up that way will probably be a, a good solution to, to start working some of those cases and getting some closure. So thank you, everybody. Great, thank you. I just wanted to address that. The controlled substance homicide cases in the past had always been really difficult. Uh, my predecessors in my office had tried a number of them, and they've been, they, they, it just didn't work. They'd put a, the, such a case in front of a jury, and the, you know, jurors would just look at it and say, well, that was just a person who wanted the drugs. You know, what are you going to do? And anyway, they did, we were not successful getting convictions. Well, with, i got to tell you, with fentanyl, things are different. Things are really different. We've been very successful because people know that fentanyl just, there's, there's a chance every time you give it to someone, it's gonna kill them. And because they know that, uh, jurors have been much more receptive to these prosecutions. And because of that, we've been handling these cases. Um, I think you all know how dangerous fentanyl is. I mean, it, it, these uh, pills that are being put out, you know, it's like playing Russian roulette. People are playing with fire. And I'll tell you, when people are playing with fire here in Whatcom County, they're going to get burned because we're going to prosecute them. Thank you. I'll go ahead to the audience first. And while the mic is going up there, I just want to remind people that we will continue the conversation uh, here after. We're going to have a break at 3 o'clock, but we'll come back and 
I just want to say I thank each and every one of you for continuously asking questions. I've gone to a lot of meetings, as many of us has, where it's hard to get engagement. And so I really appreciate each and every one of you keeping the mic being used. And uh, I just want to mention that. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chris Dingle. I'm with Representative Rick Larson's office. Uh, he apologizes for not being able to be here himself, but um, I'm personally very glad I grew up next to tribal communities in the Midwest. I have the um, honor of being married to a woman whose uh, family is uh, got uh, Alaska Native. Um, and so uh, just say thank you to Lemmy Nation for having us. Um, what I would like to ask from the federal perspective is if there are any grant programs, we've heard about Burn Jag, but are there other federal funding opportunities uh, that tribal law enforcement specifically is accessing and it's working or accessing and it's not working? And our office can potentially be a good partner to uh, navigate some of those things. So again, thank you for having us. And uh, if anyone has any answers, I'd be happy to connect uh, offline. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And we have um, two offices that are here then, uh, Congressman Rick Larson and Senator Murray's office is here and so I'm glad that we have uh, our federal representatives here and that kind of does lead me into one of the comments that I wanted to to speak to and uh, this came from a, a visit we were back in DC and we were talking about fentanyl and we have a congresswoman on the eastern side uh, congresswoman McMorris Rogers and when we went back there at the beginning of the year to talk about our advocacy efforts we know the politics, we see it in the news every day. We see it also in our local news, whether it's the counties, the cities, the states, uh, and nationally. And we know that it is, going to be get, it is going to be very challenging to get anything out of a divided Congress, a divided uh, Senate, a House, a divided uh, government. What we did get, a thumbs up on our uh, encouragement on was there are a few things that regardless of your political belief we can have a lot of common ground one is addressing the fentanyl issue another is protecting our children another is addressing mental health those are all intertwined in everything that we are here for today so regardless of your political beliefs wherever you live this is something we can make changes on and work together and when we were in that, th those discussions back in D.C. with our, our delegation, we had asked, and I, I heard some of the comments that kind of alluded to this, and it, I hope maybe we might be able to get a, a response from you know, some of our federal uh, staff here, or experts. Um, Congressman Newsom was going to introduce a bill that uh, pushes the mandatory minimum to 20 to 25 years. And when you look at the politics back in D.C., that's not going to happen. But I can tell you, though, having gone to federal court and testified against a drug dealer who his drug deal killed one of our young women here, that person only got five years. You go tell that to those children that will never see their mother again. They will never get to see their mother for the rest of their life. They are being raised by their grandparents. And this person who was not a drug user, they were just a drug dealer. And I was a probation officer before I got onto our council. And one of the things that I learned is before sentencing is a pre-sentence investigation report. And I asked that to our representatives in DC, if they're not gonna support a bill like Congressman Newsom's bill, can we find common ground? Can we talk about predatory drug dealers and separate them at least? There are a lot of people that are dealing drugs in our community and they don't have no regard for the life that they're destroying. They are there just simply to take the money and move on. And what we did get was a potential thumbs up from different offices that we didn't expect to agree. They said they would support legislation like that that does increase the federal minimum sentencing guidelines for predatory drug dealers. We have state representatives in here, county council members, tribal leaders. Those are things that we want to talk with the state about as well. With the nature of politics and what you see, 
and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, that's not my place, but to have the conversation, we should be able to agree that people that have no regard for life in our communities shouldn't be let off the hook with a hand slap. And I know law enforcement is not the, 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 always the answer that we want, but as we heard, that is a needed tool to protect our community. And we cannot take away our law enforcement, our, our judicial uh, tools that they have to do their job to keep all of us safe. And kind of on that note, and I, I guess this is a question, and we talked about this with Talalip. Uh, we've seen a number of drug dealers, drug dealers, drug deals, sorry, it's been a long day already. Um, you know, and I asked Gary, we had one of our biggest drug deals ever in Lummi come out of the casino here. We've seen some large drug dealers or drug deals down in Tulalip. And going back to the, the comment with McMorris Rogers, she was having a town hall in Spokane on big tech companies and youth, how our youth are using Snapchat and all these social media platforms to get their drugs. Lord knows you can't just, it's not always walking and talking, you communicate somehow. And there was no tribal representation on that town hall. And when you look at the data, Native Americans, the overdose death rate is 30% higher than white people or any other ethnic group. We are dying at the highest rates when it comes to overdose. And when I talked with our law enforcement here at Lummi uh, on some cases in the, in the past, whether it was rape or cyber stalking, and this is what we brought up to McMorris Rogers' office, they don't honor tribal court orders. Our law enforcement is wanting to do everything to protect our people. And this goes, like I said, it could be a rape case, stalking, you name it. Uh, those social media companies do not honor tribal court orders. And so it would cause us to have to either jump through hoops and go work with our county, and sometimes with our federal partners. And what we've seen more often than we should ever accept is we're told, no, we can't help. Um, and, and I don't know, Chief Sutter, if there's things that you can share from, from your experience, and I'd like to ask our federal partners, you know, prosecutor from the Attorney General's office, or the AG, you know, we know that the feds want to go after the big fish. We heard that. And we, we do need that. But when you're in a small community like we are here, and we're seeing our children go to more funerals than birthday parties, these small dealers that people say from the outside, they're big fish to us. There's a reason why our life expectancy has dropped six and a half years. Native Americans' life expectancy is back to the 1942 levels. In the last few years, it's dropped that much. We look at the data, we're seeing overdoses every day, unfortunately. Our laws, the challenges that we face, and seeing the drug dealers become smarter, they know they can get away with things out here. And we're seeing it, we're seeing the results. We're seeing crime rise in so many other areas and we can't address it. And so those are some of the challenges. And so when we come back, I know we're gonna have a break soon. This isn't just always about jurisdiction, it is about everything that's a challenge and how can we fix it. Like, you know what I mentioned, the, the increasing the federal minimum sentencing guidelines. You know, is that a solution that people support? Um, the, the, I think there's a lot of things that we can talk about, and I don't know, um, Chief Sutter, if you have any comments, you know, from what the things that we talked about in Tulalip, because when you showed us the, the drug bust that you guys had, that was large. I don't know if we have any response from our federal side or, you know, even the, the prosecutors from the county, but just thoughts on, on how we can address and better protect our communities. Thank you. Just really quickly, I'd like to... Um, address just a couple of things that have been mentioned today. Uh, tribal policing has taken a back seat to state and local policing in many ways perpetuated by the state in that the academy cost more for tribes until at one point tribes were constantly at the back of the waiting list. When tribal officers go to the uh, Indian Police Academy and come back to the equivalency academy, the person handing out the certificates would say, I want to talk to the real police officers, not the tribal police officers. These are what my officers tell me. So when, when we talk about staffing, we have to level this playing field. And I challenge any state or county or city police chief 
to tomorrow, go to tell your officers, by the way, there, there will be no left to retirement. You're going to work here and maybe you'll get a 401k. Your, your officers would quit instantly. But that's what we deal with every day as tribal police chiefs. Uh, until this legislative session and to let it help with the support of our legislators push this through, uh, tribal police agencies were uh, by law not allowed to participate in the state retirement system that all other police officers in the state get to enjoy. So when, when the DOJ comes asking for tribal input on VAWA or MMIW or fentanyl, staffing is incredibly important because we can't address these systemic problems without officers to run, to participate in task forces and to be detectives. So I appreciate the, the staffing and I, every white paper I write back, I always mention the staffing crisis and that tribal agencies are greatly impacted even more than state and county and city agencies. Um, when it comes to any modern day investigation, we have to have access to social media data. We have to access to phone data, Google, any apps that would be on a phone. This is how we find missing people. Uh, but when we send a tribal court warrant or subpoena for that data, nine times out of 10, it's rejected. Uh, and they don't honor our tribal court orders. And uh, so sometimes, we'll send it three or four times with rejections and then we'll just give up and go get a state court warrant and we'll get the data. So this, if there was one federal and state legislation I would really push for, for uh, controlled substance homicides, but missing murdered indigenous women and any other violent crime, it could even be finding a lost teenager or a, a, a missing young person. Uh, we need to have full faith and, and, good, and good credit for all tribal court orders and warrants statewide uh, and stop this, uh, this disparate treatment towards uh, tribal courts. They're, they should not be subordinate to state and district courts, in my opinion. So yes, we, we, we fight this challenge every day and it's, it's very frustrating to see that uh, we don't get a lot of backup uh, on, on this issue. But we're trying to do professional modern law enforcement without all the tools that any other agency gets to uh, access pretty quickly. And so well, I'm passionate about this because these are behind every death, behind every number, every missing person is a, is a life and a family that's grieving. And when we are handcuffed and we don't have the tools, it gets very frustrating. Thank you, Chief Sutter. And just looking at the, the time clock, uh, I think I want to say I'm impressed. Nobody's tried to sneak out. Uh, we are a little bit over. Uh, break was supposed to start nine minutes ago. Um, and we are going to reconvene at 3, 3.10. So wanted to make sure everybody has a quick break. Our panelists that are here, if you're able to stay, please stay. But uh, we will continue this conversation back at 3.10 here. Just want to make those comments. and. Thank you all for staying and, and please get some coffee, stretch and use the restroom and see you in a few moments again. All right, is it, is, is it time? Okay, all right, uh, we're about to get started again. Uh, hey, that, that crowd in the, in the back, can, it, can, you, can you disperse? No, I'm joking. So we'll just continue where, where we left off. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're taking notes. We got a good note taker. Um, and so this, this evening, uh, right before the cultural night, you know, we're, we're gonna debrief with each other and kind of like pull out the highlights from today's discussion. Um, and then tomorrow uh, from 10.45 to noon, uh, we're having our justice uh, recap and work session, and so that's that. That'll be tomorrow, and so that's where we're gonna kind of like uh, hammer down on, on on these issues and like look at solutions. And so, you know, this is going somewhere. Um, this is the beginning of the conversation. 
Uh, and so don't think that, you know, we're going to have this summit, then it's going to walk away. You know, and I, I think um, with, uh, like, the leadership like from, from Nick, uh, the commitment from the panel, um, we're, you know, th this work is going to continue moving forward. I, I'm pretty sure from the governor's office, uh, HCA, uh, and the AGO, like, we'll, we'll continue to convene meetings. Um, and, and we'll do follow-up, and so that's kind of like the idea moving forward. Um, and so we, we, we heard a lot, uh, the first, uh, before the break, we heard a lot from law enforcement, uh, we heard a lot from the prosecutors. Um, do we have any judges? Judges or folks that work in the court? Um, can we, can I, can we open up this part of the session? Um, getting that perspective from the court. Um, and, and and what that and what that feels like, what that looks like, um, so yeah. Hi, my name is Sophie Nomi. I'm associate judge for the Calville Tribes, and um, in talking, are looking at all the drug charges that come through the court. Um, I, the last couple of years, I haven't been dealing with the criminal aspect of the court because our chief judge assigned me different cases, a caseload. So, but when I was the acting chief judge, I oversaw a lot of the cases and um, I find that integrating traditional and custom sentencings uh, had more effect. Um, we did used to have a healing the wellness court, similar to a drug court, and that was very effective as well. Uh, our grant ran out of funding, so we didn't, the tribe didn't pick up the funding, so we lost, lost at their program. But a lot of tribal members were asking if we can have it back, and that's when I started sentencing, um, sentencing them to like traditional uh, services, such as sweats, uh, meeting with our peacemaking, um, doing community service for our elders, uh, um, talking with our elders um, about their life and getting mentorship for them. And that, that has worked in the past, and that's working a lot with our dependency cases, and that's where I oversee cases on our dependencies now. So I see a lot of growth in that, and I, I see a lot of parents um, recovering, so. All right, thank you. Do we have any folks that work in the courts? Anyone else? Okay, uh, Nick. So we, um, before we uh, took our break, we were starting to talk about some of the uh, support that we need, I think, on the federal side. And I, I know we might have response, but Chief Sutter, was there anything more that you wanted to add that you could talk about this before we hear from uh, our, our Western attorney? Just was, was curious. Um, and and if, if not, we can go to our attorney. Uh, just really quickly, on the federal side, we do work with our federal partners, the FBI, and, uh, and the U.S. Attorney's Office is, uh, I think, limited in resources. So we, we don't get as high a prosecution rate as what I would hope to see with some of our fentanyl dealing, uh, especially combined with uh, Ill illegal possession of, of firearms. But, um, you know, I always believe that there's a trust responsibility that the federal government has to Native nations. And uh, if it's a resource issue, I would, I would lobby for more resources so that they can give us more help. But, um, you know, we, we appreciate the partnerships we have. And, and as I tell them, we just wish we had more. So as we uh, ask our federal uh, Western attorney uh, professional or expert here, um, you know, we heard some of the challenges that we have with 
the full faith and credit that tribes ask for. We want our law enforcement to be treated equally and fairly, just like any other law enforcement. We want our courts to be honored and trusted just as any other court. Um, and, and when we are going through our process, we've heard that there are barriers. You know, we heard from Chief Sutter, nine out of 10 times, they won't honor a tribal court warrant. And so, you know, whether it's from the county prosecutor, the, the, the state AGs or the, or the federal side, if there's any thoughts that you have, because uh, with this part of the session, we really want to start getting to the solutions of things. And I know that there's no words that we can share in this short space that will give us the solutions. It's going to take work, but we need help in getting that direction so that we can start going down that road to get those solutions. We have a lot of people from across the state, tribal and non-tribal, uh, that we really feel are united in addressing these barriers. And so any of the responses that you know, the three of you may have, I can leave it open and maybe we'll just go down, go down the road. Sure. Um Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I'll repeat that. So we have right now one tribal liaison in the Western District, but we just received funding for two additional tribal liaisons. I have asked when we are expected to actually get those two individuals up and running, uh, and we don't have a timeline quite yet on that. I will share with you right now, I am currently in the general crimes unit at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Our tribal liaison is Tate London. I certainly hope that um, I will be able to take one of those positions once they become available, but uh, waiting for that to be decided. In terms of um, our role and what we can hopefully do to assist, you know, I, I come from a family of federal law enforcement officers, and they said one of the most frustrating frustrating things they ever heard from the U.S. Attorney's Office was, we take cases on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Um, and it was always frustrating to them because it was, well, what does that mean? Um, and can you give us more kind of definitive guidelines? So I hate to be the one to come before you and again say, we take cases on a case-by-case -case basis. But unfortunately, um, that's, that's what we do. But there are certain things that we look for uh, in our office when we are going to make a determination of whether or not we're going to prosecute a case and use the resources that we currently have in the Western District to be able to uh, bring these people to justice. I just wanted to talk about a few of those things and hopefully encourage additional conversation both with our tribal liaison that we currently have, but also the two additional tribal liaisons that are going to be coming. And then other assistant United States attorneys, because all of these cases are not necessarily handled by one assistant United States attorney. That attorney is the, the liaison is the one that is speaking to uh, tribal communities and getting those cases, but then other assistant United States attorneys can actually take those cases to trial or negotiate them or whatever they may be. Um, the certain things that we look for, of course, on our cases are the facts of the given case. Um, what is it that this person is uh, alleged to have been committing? Is it a drug trafficking case? Is it a significant drug trafficking case uh, in the specific community? And what I'm hearing is, you know, I think that the general thought is the Fed only goes after big fish. Of course, in the specific communities here, um, a lot of the tribal communities are smaller communities. What may be a big fish to some is a big fish to uh, individual tribal communities, and I think that we need to recognize that more at the U.S. Attorney's Office when we are evaluating and looking at the facts. In addition to the specific facts of the case, we also look to the history. So what is this person coming in um, to our office with? Do they have past drug history? Do they have past violent history? Um, Blake also impacted us significantly in that when we're looking at the history, are these things no longer gonna be counted, for example, is something that we take into consideration uh, for their offender scores, for example. 
We also look at kind of the likely outcome of the case, and that takes into consideration the facts of the case, as well as the criminal history and what their offender score is going to be at the federal level. And I think what's really important also to take into consideration is our uh, guidelines are not necessarily, the judge doesn't necessarily have to follow them. Um, there is not a requirement for the judge to pick a sentence in between, um, let's say somebody's got an offender score that puts them from 24 months to 36 months. Uh, they are simply um, suggestions, for lack of a better word, and the hope is that they will follow that, but it's not necessarily mandatory that they do so, um, unlike potentially at the state level. So that's something that we also take into consideration when we're looking at our cases. Uh, to take a step back for the facts of the case, we are looking at quantity, what kind of drugs we're dealing with, was a firearm used, uh, what's the culpability of the particular offender that we're looking at. So those are different things that we take into consideration when we might potentially take a case. Um, other than that, uh, I think you know, we do need to take additional steps to come into tribal communities and learn what is impacting and affecting uh, the communities every day uh, and what we can do to use our limited resources and now our hopefully more resources to assist as much as we can and take on cases. So I'm happy to answer questions if I can, um, but again, uh, that is kind of an outline of what we're looking at. So the, the question, the question about uh, getting warrants uh, and tribal agencies having trouble getting warrants is, is interesting to me. The statute that allows uh, local agencies to get information through search warrants from large companies like Google or Facebook or, or something else is a federal statute. And that means that if there are problems for the tribes getting this kind of information, it, it would be a federal fix. It would need to be some, some legislation through the federal government. Um, I wasn't aware of this. I wasn't aware that tribes were having problems doing this. I can tell you that uh, we would support anyone, any tribe, get these warrants if, if we were asked. I, I, we, uh, we support other states doing it. We do it by uh, using an affiant through our superior court judges locally, and that's what it would require uh, for the tribes to do as well. And then we, you could get the same information that you would get. Um, it would be just using our judges. And I know that the sheriff's office would support this as well. And Doug's nodding, so the answer is yes. We, 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 we would get it done. We would get it done for you. Um, and if, if that's... If the tribes aren't included in those statutes, that would be, be a federal fix. Um, something else that I just wanted to address that I've heard before um, from tribal law enforcement when our office started a, a missing and murdered indigenous persons task force, and also when I've attended uh, meetings of the uh, Washington Association of Police Chiefs and there was a tribal law enforcement section is, is not getting uh, tribal arrest warrants honored in state courts when somebody who's the subject of uh, a warrant that's been issued by a tribal a court and that person's found by Washington law enforcement um, and, and they're not arrested. Uh, Washington law just doesn't allow for that. There's a statute that says um, Washington law enforcement can arrest for felony warrants from out of state, but it doesn't address the tribe. So if, if that's an issue, that would need to be a state uh, legislative fix to fix that. And I know there are several states that do that. I think Montana and one of the Dakotas, I can't remember north or south, have statutes that allow their local law enforcement to arrest on tribal warrants. Another issue that I've heard from tribal law enforcement in the past is just, um, you know, having criminal history records um, from tribal courts, um, you know, in into the state system, so that state police officers and, and law enforcement from other jurisdictions can see when uh, there's a conviction or a protection order or, or an arrest warrant and things like that. And um, there's a lot of a lot of barriers to that that I think also involve federal law in that. Um, the Washington State Patrol Chief Batiste Agency has a criminal history section that's kind of the clearinghouse for criminal history records in Washington. But uh, the FBI controls kind of the, the bigger national clearinghouse of criminal history information and they have a lot of rules and restrictions about what can be added to that. And so I think if, 
if that was also something that the, uh, was an issue of interest that would also need to be addressed uh, in federal law. And then last, I just kind of wanted to generally address the, the authority of the Attorney General's Office in uh, criminal law. In Washington, unlike some other states, the Attorney General's Office does not have original criminal jurisdiction. Um, that is left to the cities and the counties and the state patrol. Um, and then criminal prosecutions are left to the city prosecutors and the county prosecutors, unless uh, either a county prosecutor like Eric or the governor asks us uh, to become involved in a criminal investigation or prosecution. Um, in the division that I supervise, we have a group of, of prosecutors who do that, usually when the county has a conflict of interest or some of the smaller rural counties just need uh, help due to resource issues. I, I appreciate the conversation. Um, I just wanted to also uh, remind everybody that uh, we do have mics that we can run around. So if there are questions, and I do see some hands pop up right in the back. Uh, Catherine, um, I think some are in the back. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Summer Hammonds. My Indian name is Lahus. Um, I work for Tulalip Tribes. I'm a tribal member, but I work for our Treaty Rights and Governmental Affairs Department. And one thing that I'd like to do is thank everybody in this room for coming together. This is a really near and dear discussion to all of our hearts. We have board members that have stories. We each have stories of, um, of our brothers or our, our children in the system, and um, one of the things that I do at Tlalip is the social changes. And I really appreciate working um, with our leadership that's on the panel today. Um, one other perspective that we didn't talk about today is that on our reservation, not everybody lives on our reservation due to housing. So they're in the other counties, like let's say Everett as an example. Um, I moved to Everett not that long ago, so I have to deal, you know, with the, I'm in this um, kind of walking through the social system to working with Everett. But my question is for those that um, don't live on the reservation, and I have Star here, and I think it's a, a little testimony because when we're working with county systems, how, um, how can we improve those social systems to enhance the lives of our, of our children? Um, my daughter works at Quilceda Elementary School now, and a lot of the children don't live on the res, but they want to go to school there. So we, we're talking real life jurisdictional issues where not everybody lives on the reservation, but they're a tribal member or they're, they're urban. And my question today, I'm going to turn it over to Star, is why would we have to go the MMIP route? to find somebody that's near and dear to us rather than having systems solved in the county system. So I just wanted to chat really quick with Star so that she could um, take about five minutes to elaborate her real story of working in the system. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Star. Oh my God. Annie Buju. My name is Star Naia. Um, I'm an Anishinaabe from Canada, but I'm here in Washington State. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the Tulalip Tribal Police because they did something for me that was so amazing when I was um, employed with Tulalip. They did help me with the MMIP for my son, Tahi Naia Shepard. He's been, he was missing at that point about five months, and the chief of police issued an MMIP for me because Everett wouldn't. And we are urban indigenous people. We don't have our tribes near here. Um, and so we needed help. Um, initially, that launching of M MIP was, was phenomenal, a comfort to me, because it meant that his face as an indigenous person was out there and that his plight was out there now because he is you know, definitely suffering from OUD. Um, that's a whole other story. But what I've been told time and time again is that officers of the law um, tell us that their hands are tied, that they can't do anything because our children are over the age of 18. And it needs to go um, said that just because a child is over the age of 18 doesn't mean that they're healthy, well, and wise. There are on board 
mental health crisis that they're suffering from early childhood. So when an officer of the law or a court, uh, a judge of the court tells us that their hands are tied, that they can't do anything, we're asking them to dive a little bit deeper, to dig a little bit deeper, because it's not just what you see on the surface as a person who's suffering from addiction disease. And addiction is not a choice, by the way. Anybody in here who thinks addiction is a choice? You know, I'm hoping that nobody raises their hands. Addiction is a disease and it's a disorder and it stems from trauma. It begins with trauma. And so all of our people that are out there, especially I can speak to my indigenous people, they have trauma that they're dealing with. And we need help from the law enforcement. We need MMIP in the city. We need it on the reservations. But more importantly, we need officers. We need social workers, people that understand that these people that are out there that are suffering on the streets have mental health disorders. They're not criminal. They're not throwaways. Their families love them. They grew up with love and culture and homes. And they're out there because they're sick. They're out there because they think that nobody loves them. And for two years, I've been pounding the pavement of Everett, Seattle, Arlington, looking for my son who has mental health disorders. And police, they do what they can, but they say, we don't want to get fired. We can't do anything. Our hands are tied. If you want change, they said vote. That's what they tell me. When I ask them, that drug house right there, when you guys gonna shut it down? We can't do anything. You want change? Vote. That's what I get told time and time again. I could throw a stone at about 10 different drug houses just around my house. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot that I could say, including that when my son was incarcerated in the correction center to be a material witness for a murder trial, which by the way, he did his civic duty and he pointed at the guy that shot three people and many more and he added his testimony and put this guy away in jail. They then gave him $40 and set him loose, where he then ran down 1,000 feet to the nearest drug house and relapsed after 13 days of being in protective custody as a material witness after I begged them not to give him that money. This, this session, I, I don't have enough time to tell you where I've been let down by the legal system, by law enforcement, by the courts, by the judges. God bless them all for the job that they're doing. But these are our children. And if you have a child, anyone in this room, imagine not seeing your child for seven, going on eight months now because they're suffering from an OUD, not a choice to be out on the streets. It's not their choice. Thank you. Yeah, I want to say, first of all, thank you. You brought up a point that we haven't got to talk about yet. And for many of us in our community, we have family members that are addicted, whether it's fentanyl, opiates, alcohol. And when we say that they burn their bridge, that's saying it simply. Uh, many of us see people that are struggling with this disease, this addiction, and we don't even recognize them no more. And so you brought up a point that I, I think it transitions into a different part of a conversation that we haven't had to have. And, and, and I know we could hear from our prosecutors and as you said, our law enforcement, that's a legislative fix. We have representatives here from state leadership as well as some federal offices. And, and I know uh, Representative Lekhanoff, you're gonna have to leave soon. Uh, but as we were talking, you know, if there's any thoughts that you have as a state legislator on just the overall conversations you've been hearing, but also on the comments that were just said, th those are the solutions that we need to get to. And anytime we can have our legislators hear the conversations, when it speaks to your heart, and Star, I know how hard it's been, but you're speaking from your heart, and I hope everybody knows what she was going through and, and would look to any of our offices or elected officials to have any response because there is legislative fixes and this might be some of the things that we can talk about or work towards. So I, I just want to be respectful to you in the time that you have with us and thank you for being here. Anything that you can help with responding to this comment from Star and anyone in this session would be appreciated. Um, thank you. First, it's an honor to be in the Homelands Alumni Nation. Um, to the to those who have recovered earlier, to the gentleman down in the maroon sweatshirt, to the young lady that was sitting there, um, it's an emotional time and my heart goes out. And it's, it's the 
voice that you shared that really brings strength to the room. Um, to star, my prayers are with you and your son. I'm following what happened, what happened with, if, within the hospital and how Ricky's law was not implemented correctly. It took every bone of my body not to run down there and hug you. Um, my heart's with you, and this is why we do the work we're doing. So I'm Representative Deborah Lakanoff. I serve the 40th Legislative District. Uh, my family comes from Southeast Alaska, a small town, and part Clinket, part Aleut. Uh, I worked a lot. Thank you to my police chiefs. Thank you to my police and public safety officers here. Thank you for keeping my community safe. Uh, thank you for keeping my daughter safe. Um, I am a strong supporter of public safety. I'm a strong supporter of following the law. Uh, thank you to our participants. Um, Thank you to the tribal police chiefs. Like I, I keep thanking you guys for how much you all have supported me in my f coming into my five years of legislation. Thank you, Eric, for being creative, innovative, and compassionate. Uh, the look you gave her when she said, I remembered you and you changed my life, that's why we do what we do. So I, today I'm just coming purely from a legislative perspective and I'll share a couple things that I've heard. Uh, these are things that I wanna go back and work on. Um, Thank you to the Squaxin chairman who reminded us common grounds at all, levels of at all levels of government with respect to jurisdiction, sovereignty, and policy and law. That's what grounds us here today. I wanna to talk to you about the drug task forces. We need to find a drug, there are 21, we need 38 in every county and we need to fully fund them at the state level. It is not just the county or the local level to fund them, that's our responsibility at the state and federal level. I understand the Department of Commerce came out with a statement that said they no longer want to fund from the administrative level all of our drug task forces that are already underfunded and understaffed. I'm committed to working with all of you. I have a meeting coming up with Director Funk. I'll be reaching out to you folks. I'll be reaching out to my police chiefs and to um, local government prosecutors to remind the Department of Commerce that these need to be funded and maybe it needs to be routed out of, outside of the Department of Commerce and into an agency that actually really understands. I'll be also working with David McMahon, or I'm sorry, Jim McMahon, and also um, with the WASPIC and also with David Hayes, who comes out of Snohomish County um, for the Narcotics Department. A Little bit of a fix there. I'm hearing also legislative fix. Um, thank you, uh, Whatcom County, for being so bold as to do the delivery um, ruling. Uh, I'd like to take a look at that and find out how, how we take a look at either the Blake decision or new law. Because thank you, Nick, I think we need to look seriously at if it's not a federal fix, a state fix on stricter laws on, on delivery, now that we can connect it to fentanyl. Um, there's a model that works, let's use it. So thank you to that, I think we need to take a look at that. Um, removing barriers and clear pathways for cross jurisdiction to support the shortfall in crisis. Going back to our drug task forces, we don't have enough staff to fulfill it at the tribal level, local level, the state, or the federal level. Um, we also are hearing, thank you, Swinomish, one officer walking into a dangerous situation is not acceptable. One, one police officer at the local level or the county level walking into a place is not sustainable, it's not acceptable. We need to find long-term pathways, but I also need to find ways, and this comes from prosecutors, police chiefs, local public safety. How do we do better cross-jurisdiction? It's a Band-Aid, but how can we do it? Because it's gonna take us a long time f to fulfill all of our job duties. Sorry, I'm once a staffer, always a staffer. Um, I want to talk about how our police chiefs are coming back and hearing that their tribal officers are not being treated with equality, with the respect. And one of the things that we understood in working with uh, then uh, Captain Monica Alexander, now as Executive Director of the Criminal Law and Justice Academy, I hope I got that acronym right, um, we are developing tribal curriculum that provides training, mandated training for early officers to understand laws, jurisdiction, and how and what it's like to work in Indian country and what case models look like. The curriculum, curriculum is now being developed. For those public officers who have already come out of the academy, they'll be required to take online courses. The thought here is if you as a non-native, non-tribal police officer can clearly understand what the chief is having to go through every day and what jurisdiction laws are in Indian country, you'll gain the respect of what he has to face every day. And not only that, our tribal police officers are new and non-native also. They'll also learn in the same pathway. We're creating a stronger family. Educate, educate, educate. 
Uh, review and address stricter sentencing for drug dealers. I, I, I agree with that. I followed up. Notice I wrote it twice. Um, re removing barriers in agencies for tribal warrants for data and court orders. Thank you to Layla for working with me on that. Uh, tribal warrants for not only data, but for, did I, if I say this right, Brian, extraction for humans is also really needed to be addressed. Not only do tribal warrants need to be recognized um, by the state, but the tribes need to recognize the state warrants. Oftentimes we know criminals are hiding on the reservation for what they did off reservation. We know those who did bad things to us on reservation are hiding off reservation, and that needs to come to, to a stop. And if they're not gonna do it at the federal level, thank you to whoever mentioned it. Um, they're doing it in other states, sir. You're absolutely right. We're taking those models and seeing what we can do. Brian offered up a couple good ideas. We quickly ran them through. That just popped up a few minutes ago. So we're gonna move those forward. I know I have a lot of work, right? <laughs> Data collection on referrals and analyzing on those. So we talked about the fact that the referrals are not being tracked. We don't know what's working and what's not working. We need to make sure that the legislature, when we do our analysis, puts that information in there and we do it in consultation with the tribes. Um, if this referrals program is not going to work, then we need to be able to be able to pivot and fix the law that we just, that we just rectified on May 14th. <coughs> Data barriers between tribal, local, state, and federal to resolve common criminal actions. If we can't get our tribal warrants into the state system, then how are we really providing public safety for all Washingtonians? Because we may be tribal people first, but I have a responsibility to the state legislature, to you, Nick, as a Washingtonian, as a Washington citizen. So removing those barriers and updating the data system so they actually can talk to one another. Fund and support cross-court systems between local and tribal systems. If a tribal person is arrested, if I'm a tribal person and I'm arrested off res, can then Prosecutor Ritchie turn me over to the wellness court in Lummi Nation and they can, they, can they can do the prosecution there. Whether that's an administrative fix or a legislative fix, we'll find out. We can do it without, if we can do it. That's it. So I know there's more to come, but Nick, you asked for solutions at the legislative level. These are just a few that I've heard uh, from all of you. So these aren't my ideas, these are your ideas. But in order to do this, I really need strong consultation with the tribes. Um, one of the things uh, Chief and I talked about was we don't have a consultation process in the state legislature, and there was no consultation process when we did the legislative fix on, on May 14th. No consultation done with the tribes. But we want to be able to change that, and representation matters. So being a Native American, Chief and I are thinking of pulling together every two weeks during the interim, and then every month during uh, I'm sorry, every month during the interim and every two weeks during the legislature, if we're going to be working on public safety bills, then we need to be sitting down as elected leaders and talking to our, and holding consultation with our elected chiefs, our elected leaders, and our prosecutors, or else I'm making laws down in, in, down in Olympia that are not implementable. So at that, Ace is cutting me off. That's all I got. <laughs> all right. You guys write that down? <laughs> um, and, and, and so the, today, uh, well, the, this week also is, uh, we, we invited Chief Sam White. He's from Lower Awa, Chief. Uh, he serves on, on the WASPIC board, um, but they're having their conference as well this week. And so he, uh, I did ask him to descend someone um, from the WASPIC. We have someone from WASPIC. I thought he sent somebody. Yeah, no, I, no I, I talked with Chief Sam White, and he said he, he's going to send another delegate in his place. Um, I, don't, I don't see him. Okay, well, that's all right. Um, okay, so, well, there's that. And then the other thing, uh, Chairman Erickson, uh, he, he, he had this burning question he wanted to ask this group. Um, he's, he's, he's not here. He's, he's one of the, he was supposed to be co-facilitator. He has COVID. Kind of crazy. He found out he got COVID, and so, you know, hopefully he, He'll recover. Um, one question he did ask, though, um, you know, as 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 we go through through this uh, jurisdictional maze, you know, um, and he shared with me a couple times. Uh, so you 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 have a, a family on the reservation. They're married. Uh, one spouse is tribal. One spouse is non-tribal. Um, <clears throat> and 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 so one of the spouse. Um, 
is, is a dealer and they, they get kicked off the res. You know, they can ban them from the reservation. As tribes have done that in the past, they, they, they banish people. Um, but the house, where, where the house is, is fee land. And, and so how do you, uh, like, what's law enforcement do? Because um, it's fee land, uh, the, the guy is non-tribal, um, can, can he go back to his house after, he's, after he got banned? And so that's, that's something that, that uh, Chairman Erickson talks about all the time. And so I, I don't know the answer. Like what, I mean, do they have to like use a helicopter to come into the house? You know, like what's... Well, yeah. So, so I have a comment on that. And that. Actually, I was just told this a few moments ago. Um, you know, we talk about cultural and traditional law in, in Indian country. One of the things that Lummi had historically done was banish people. That is basically stripping them of their identity as a tribal member in Lummi. We don't take that lightly when we do that. Um, what we have seen is as we try to do that to a tribal member that is one of the most severe laws that that can be applied to you that takes away everything for me as a tribal member and while that is a serious crime on the reservation and to a tribe it is a misdemeanor or a slap in the hand if anything at all to the state or to the county or to the feds and so i think to the comment because we had somebody that was banished in our casino just a few moments ago. And our law enforcement couldn't do anything. This person has caused harm to so many people in our community. And we did everything possible to the fullest extent of our law. And they can come in here and law enforcement can't do anything except tell them to leave. So those are things I, I think, so just listening to the comment and I, I don't know if there's thoughts and I, th I think that's going to be a legislative fix again, you know, working with the feds. If we banish somebody from federal lands, we should have our, the trustees right there supporting us. But going back to some of the earlier comments where it feels like our big fish are little fish. And so this was just an example of a little bit ago where this happened just today. And, and how can we protect our community if we can't even keep the offenders away from our community? And so if there's any thoughts to those, you know, from, from our prosecutor side or, you know, even any of our law enforcement side uh, that has thoughts to that. Because I know Tulalip and many of the other tribes, they do those type of practices as well. Gary might be able to add a little bit more um, to that. I knew I shouldn't have come in here. I got a lot of comments because it this hits home for me. Um, you know, one, you know, I worked this for a lot of years, but two, I'm still working it. Uh, we see this, like Nick was saying, um, we see this daily. And I helped write Title 12, which is the exclusion code. And that was what we thought was needed way back then to protect our community. And um, the unfortunate part behind that is, I think somebody said it, is some of the roads that go through the reservation are, are county jurisdiction only. So we have one family that we thought we excluded off the reservation, but they were allowed access to their property via the county roadway and to their property. So that really didn't do us any good at all. I mean, we're trying and trying and trying. Um, like I was saying earlier, when we catch them here, we can only slap them on the hand and say, hey, you need to leave the casino because we have the right to refuse service to anybody. And we'll, ex we'll exclude them for five years. And Nick, I'm, I'm sorry to contradict you just a little bit. Our tribal law enforcement, they can do a little bit. They're, they're, they can charge them with trespass. But really, is that a whole lot? It's, you know, trespass isn't much. That's all they can do. Um, unless they're caught red hat and with, the, with the drugs. And we can prove that they have the drugs on them. And 
and things like that. So, um, but I think the exclusion code really needs to be looked at again, and, and how do we how do we really address that and 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 protect our communities like we should? Because stripping our tribal members of their membership, because that's how we had to do it. You can't exclude a tribal member from the reservation. You have to strip them of their enrollment first, and then you can exclude them. So, is that doing harm or good? You know, it's it's stripping away who we are as as native people. But on the other hand, we're trying to protect our communities that are trying to do the best they can with what we have. So uh, those are just some short comments that I had. Thanks, Nick. I, I appreciate that, Gary, and I'm always happy to be corrected. And I, I get the technical part that you said, but uh, you are right on that. We can press uh, trespassing charges, uh, but the, the fact, I, I guess, why I say that is uh, we just give them a piece of paper and say, see you later. And that's not protecting our community because they come back a minute later, too. And we're right back in the same boat. The county won't take it. They can't book them. The feds won't take it. And I know there's been um, things where Tulalip has shared those kind of uh, examples as well. And so I don't know if there's any kind of responses to that from our, our federal, state, and local, you know. I have, I have a thought. So uh, on this and actually a number of the other issues that have been coming up, there's two things that have worked really well for us in the past, and I know for other tribes as well, but the first is obviously um, getting general authority peace officer status for tribal officers, huge, game changer. Um, and in our county, the county officers have tribal credentials. Um, erases a lot of the problems that we've been dealing with. And I know there's other tribes, um, well, me too, I believe, right, that have the same situation. Uh, the SALSA program, Special Assistant United States Attorney, in years past we've had several different SALSAs and until I think, what, about six months, a year ago, we, ha we had a SALSA um, working through a grant at Swinomish who took a lot of our um, drug dealing, non-native drug dealing and, and firearm cases. These are both really powerful examples of how we've come up with systems to reach across the jurisdictional mess that we find ourselves in, right? Like native, non-native, fee land, trust land, uh, you know, on and off reservation. I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, what would happen if we had cross commissions for prosecutors? What would happen if we did it for judges? There are examples of this outside the state, joint jurisdiction courts, um, prosecutors, state and tribal that are like SAUSAs. Um, it's something we should talk about, I think, because if, if we go down that road together with the state, I think we could make a difference on a lot of these issues that we're seeing. I, I appreciate that recommendation, and I don't know if there's any response to that. I know you, when um, uh, Representative Lincolnoff mentioned that comment, you, Eric, you mentioned that we can do some of the things that maybe she mentioned. I don't know if you can touch on that. Um, if there's any thoughts that you have on what our tribal prosecutor had said, it would be greatly appreciated as well as maybe some potential things that we can explore, your thoughts on that. I, I think, and to everybody else, this is going to the solution part of the conversations where we want to start getting to. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, a lot of the things that uh, have been scribed down, we made sure that we captured them. Uh, Representative Lakenoff did an amazing job just in the short time that she heard, or she was here in hearing all of you. Uh, and I was thankful to Representative Lakenoff for sharing that she's going to take that back down to Olympia and work on things that you all said. And so that again shows that this this kind of space does make a difference in having these conversations. But I wanna ask our panelists here for any thoughts. Sure, so we do have some cross deputizing and that's uh, that we've provided the authority to arrest for Lummi tribal officers to, uh, I guess, to take care of um, non-natives on Lummi land. Now, I, I thought that we had done it, um, you know, cross that, our local deputies would be able to also prosecute, or ask, I should say arrest uh, tribal members, but I, I just got the, the head shake from our undersheriff saying that was not part of the MOU. Um, and I think that had something to do with resources. We were talking about it uh, at one point, trying to figure out exactly what would make sense. And uh, I think it was a resource issue. Uh, just like the rest of you, Whatcom County has been short of deputies. And um, you know, we've, we've been working real hard. And, and we may be getting up to full staff now, but I'm not sure if it's a full staff there that uh, Whatcom County would be willing to uh, jump into that fray. Uh, but this is something that should be discussed. I think that we should be talking about it and seeing to see if that's something we can do. As far as cross uh, deputizing prosecutors, I, I'd never heard of that. Um, it's an interesting thought. 
I, uh, you know, I, I think that's also w worth discussing. I'm not even sure what it would take to get there. It probably, probably would be some sort of uh, uh, legislative change, uh, probably. John, do you have any thoughts about that? No, I mean, uh, I guess it depends on, on what it is you're trying to accomplish and, and how, but, you know, I suppose, you know, a, a county prosecutor could oh. appoint, sure. you know, a, a, a tribal prosecutor as a special prosecutor and vice versa. It's just a matter of resources and, and the willingness to, to do that if it would uh, work in a particular situation. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So I do have I do have the ability to appoint other deputy prosecutors outside of my office, do work within my office and do work in our courts. And I, I do that regularly. And I guess that's another way that we could do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess I, I'd be kind of curious uh, if, if uh, our esteemed panelists at the down at the end could explain what, what situations uh, that might be appropriate. For prosecutors or judges, I guess I want to start with judges because that's a more well-trod well road. Um, in other states, it hasn't required special legislation. There are a handful of joint jurisdiction courts, and actually like in Washington State, the, the county, the superior court, even the district court, they have, they have a process for appointing judges just like you have a process for deputizing prosecutors, and they can use that to put... Uh, the credentials into a person who's going to sit with a tribal court judge, or you can put both credentials on the same person, and then you can you can start the work of a joint jurisdiction court, um, executing warrants, things like that. For prosecutor, I mean, this the Salsa program is the only one that I'm familiar with, um, and that gets used both to have a pro it's it's a body problem, right? We, we need resources. Well, so like the Swinomish example, we get a grant, we get a prosecutor. They're able to take cases that otherwise normally wouldn't be taken because it wouldn't be a person to prosecute them. Um, the set two spouses that we've had in our office actually went back and forth between tribal court uh, and federal court, and and provided some continuity there, which which has been. Uh, really helpful when we've had the positions. Um, I understand Eastern District may make more use of SAUSAs. Now, in terms of the state court context, when would it make sense? You know, one thing that, that we've talked about, so we have a nuisance property code. The county has a nuisance property code. The land base is a crazy patchwork quilt. And it's really hard to even get started on an investigation because you don't know what you're going to find. And at least 50% of the time, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. Uh, and that's where if you had one person with both credentials, they'd have the time. They could just pick a problem area that everyone knows is a problem area. The county knows it's a problem area. We know it's a problem area. But no one person can handle it. I'll just finish that up by saying we should talk. Thank you. Yeah, write that one down. <laughs> yeah, and I think on our end, um, I... I can certainly speak to the U.S. Attorney and our liaison and see if we can get the SALSA program up and running again. I know that it's historically worked really well, um, and hopefully we can bring that back. Well, I, I appreciate that this is solution-oriented uh, live, and so I appreciate the, the conversation and acknowledging that we might not have known things, and but by having this space and this conversation, uh, it's making it better, and as you know, we're getting things scribed. Uh, this will also be a recommendation to the governor tomorrow. And so I wanted to also, I guess, reach out and see if there's any other questions, thoughts that anybody else wants to share. We do have till five. I see. Yeah, we got one over here. Okay. Robin Butterfield, Macaw Tribe, Acting Chief of Police. Um, I was just curious on the new laws, if there's any training resources available. Macaw is kind of behind the curve on that part. Um, uh, and who's responsible for that? Is it the tribe's responsibility to keep up on the new laws, or does the state step in or the federal step in to help us out with that? Are, are you talking about the fix to State v. Blake? Yeah, like the Blake issue. Yeah. I'm, I'm not aware of any training. Um, Chief, I don't know if, if WASPIC's going to do anything, but... Um, um, is your uh, agency certified through CJTC? Do you do, you do that? A lot of our officers are trained yeah. through yeah. federal FLETC, BIA yeah. cores. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the short answer is I'm not aware of, of anybody that's putting on any training yet, but if I hear of it, I'll certainly 
pass that along. And, and it just happened, you know, last week. And, and it's relatively, relatively simple. I mean, it just, uh, possession of a controlled substance beginning on July 1st is uh, a gross misdemeanor. Um, there's no more requirement to uh, defer them or divert them to resources, although law enforcement is encouraged to do so. Uh, but between now and uh, July 1st, it's a simple misdemeanor. Um, and there's the requirement uh, of defer, you know, diverting them to resources the first two times. And actually, I think we just discovered there's an a unintended glitch, I think, in the, in the recent le legislation in the manner in which they repealed the old statute such that uh, the requirement for two diversions is going to continue till 90 days after May 14th, which is when they fix it, so, such that that's going to continue until August 14th, if, if I'm making any sense. So, yeah. so I'd like to suggest that you reach out to your local county prosecutor, uh, whoever that is in your uh, area, they should come in and, and give you any sort of training that you ask for. I've been out to our Lummi uh, uh, Police Department several times and spoken about the changes in laws and, and uh, what we think would be helpful when, uh, when handling cases in our jurisdiction. It's, uh, it's not required, but it's certainly something that they should do by courtesy, and I, th I think you should reach out to them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to add to that. You know, er Eric and I uh, both attend meetings of the Washington Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, and, and I know you were just out for a week, but, um, you know, since the time that the legislature enacted the, the Blake fix, you know, th there were prosecutors saying, I, I need to go out and, and educate my local law enforcement on this. and. So I, I think Mark Nichols is, is your prosecutor in Clallam County. And um, uh, I, I don't know if, if you know, if, if you're on any kind of, uh, you know, listserv or anything uh, with him and, and other agencies. But like Eric said, that, that would be a good resource to, to get training. I, I was just going to add to that. Um, I don't know if Macaw is eligible, but WASPIC had some training funds for state mandated trainings uh, and uh, they made that available to the tribes and it was a very easy application. So you might check with WASPIC to see if there's any assistance in the way of uh, offsetting the cost of your training, but also uh, I agree, reach out to your local prosecutor and see if they can uh, do a in-service training for um, any, any new state laws that might be applicable and based on your uh, status with the state. Um, I don't think you're general peace officer authority, but I don't know if you have a, a cross deputization with the sheriff or anything like that. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Questions? I was just going to make a one comment. You know, the, the, the current Blake fix is, is that you know, law enforcement sh uh, has to uh, divert arrestees to uh, treatment resources the first two times, and then after July or after August 14th, it'll be strongly encouraged. But I think it goes without saying that if there's nowhere to divert them to, um, it's it's kind of it's kind of meaningless. Uh, the, the the prosecutor from Asotan County, who actually just very sadly uh, passed away on Friday. Uh, at the meetings that Eric and I attend, he would frequently complain because there would be all of um, you know laws that were passed to to, to help people and, and divert them into treatment. But in Asotan County, where he worked, there were no treatment centers and nowhere like within a hundred miles, and so that, that really wasn't an option for them. Um, I thought it was really powerful uh, this morning uh, hearing about you know what Lummy is doing and you know, having somewhere where a person can go and do detox or treatment or get medication, um, giving police the power or encouraging them to divert uh, persons they're arresting who are suffering from substance use disorder uh, is, is meaningless if there's nowhere for them to go. I've got one there in the middle. A quick question. Is there anybody from Nisqually here? Nisqually? So I uh, just wanted to ask a question. Um, so in the Nisqually jail, um, one of the big problems we have around the state is even if you, if you get a prosecutor who will charge and they go out on warrant status, 
Um, the vast majority of the jails in the state won't even let you bring a person into admin book on their warrant status and get them a fresh court date. And the folks on the streets know that. And Nisqually has been a great resource uh, in the Thurston County area. Um, as far as I know, Nisqually Jail is about the only jail that's consistently accepting misdemeanor warrants um, to at least get that new court date started. And I was wondering how you guys, are you familiar with that, how that jail came to be such a regional asset? And is that a model that other areas could then use or mimic um, to help out if we can't get county jails built somewhere? Um, my name is Justine Capra. I'm Director of Governmental Affairs for Nisqually. Back in 2009, Thurston County didn't have a regional jail. Their jail was overcrowded, actually, and it was dilapidated. And so um, it came to Nisqually's attention. I think it was actually brought to their attention that there is this need in the community. So N N Nisqually worked with um, Department of Justice and implemented a public safety complex. And it really filled the gap that Thurston County was needing for the people that were incarcerated in our jurisdictions. So um, Lacey, Tumwater, Tanano, Yelm, a lot of the area municipalities came to Nisqually as well as Department of Correction and other jurisdictions, and Nisqually just stepped up to the plate. And um, since then, they've been implementing different things within their uh, public safety complex. Obviously, incarceration is not the number one thing that the tribe is wanting to do. I'm a former um, officer within uh, the area I used to work with, the Olympia Police Department, years ago. <laughs> um, when somebody gets arrested, obviously you need a place for them to go, but I personally don't believe in incarceration. I think, you know, it touches the need at the time that somebody is needing that, and it can help in most situations, but helping and getting something that doesn't encourage recidivism is really important, and I think Nisqually has really recognized that, trying to heal the whole person, and so they're just doing um, multiple things within Nisqually. One of the things at the public safety complex is they're implementing a step-down detox program. So they're having, um, I don't think that they're open yet. They still are needing um, a couple more parts just because of COVID. It's just put it back a little bit. But somebody that comes in with a substance use disorder, they're giving them 24-7 medical assisted treatment and then putting them into a pod system where they can still have that wraparound services and then back out into the general population. And then from there, try to connect them to resources within the community. So I think it was a, um, a situational thing. I don't think that it was something that Nisqually thought, let's have a public safety complex. And I can't speak to that. I wasn't working for them back in 2009, but I think that they saw that it was an, um, a need in the community and they just stepped up to the plate. So I don't know if I've answered that question fully, but. No, that, that definitely did. It's, like I said, it's a great resource in the greater Thurston County area because I, I agree incarceration is not the answer, but, but being able to bring them in and get them refreshed in the system and a new court date and give an opportunity for resources at that time, whether it's an admin booking or not, um, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great program there and, and a model that I think would be really good around the state. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay. I just had another quick question um, in regard to um, the treatment of my son who was in a witness protection situation put into um, isolation. Um, 20 months of straight opioid use thrown into King County transported to Snohomish County, and when I got on the phone with the Snohomish County prosecuting attorney and her assistant, I asked, because he has 20 straight months of opioid use, he's going to be coming down in an, in, in, in an inexplicable way. Second of all, all of the reasons why he was using to begin with are going to start to rear its ugly head, hence his mental illness. Can you please depose him, do a deposition instead, instead of putting him on the the, the stand and putting in front of the murderer who he had to testify against. I was told by the prosecuting attorney that they can't do that in a criminal case and they had to put him on the stand. But then I researched it and that was amended in November of 2022. Um, and it said that, you know, if a witness is, is hard to 
you know, if there's a situation that arises and a witness is hard to um, not control, but I don't, I don't know the right l legal terms, if they're having a difficulty with a witness, hence mental illness and opioid use disorder, that they can depose him behind closed doors. So my question is, why didn't the prosecuting attorney know that this law had been amended, and why didn't they offer that to my son? Because being on the trial, being on the witness stand, further traumatized him from witnessing a murder, and hence the reason why he's gone again. First off, I want to say that I'm really sorry that that happened. I, I completely understand how uh, putting someone on a witness stand traumatizes folks. And, and you know, I'll tell you, we're very careful. We think about that whenever we do it. Uh, there are times when we think that uh, it's necessary. What happened to you would be incredibly unusual. Um, but I, you know, I certainly understand the pain that you went through from it. Um, I'm ill prepared, or else I would read you the uh, I'd read you the numbers. I'd read you the amendment. I I looked it up and studied it and researched it and presented it after the fact. I would give it to you if I had that information, but it just popped into my head to ask this question. So you're unaware of the amendment as well? No. That's a problem. Right, and I was just going to say if if uh, if I had some service here, I could Google it, but I don't, yeah. and I can't. Promise you, it's there. Okay. Um, just material witness. He was a material witness in a murder trial. So uh, they amended it, uh, the process of being able to have him in person if there's onboard uh, difficulties to have him be a solid witness, which there was, because there was jail call after jail call after jail call to me saying he was going to commit suicide because he was terrified. And they still put him up there. They also put him in a, in a holding cell where he couldn't talk to anybody and he, he went further down the rabbit hole, if you will. So they treated him horribly. I'm, so, I'm sorry. So I, I think that brings me to the, the next comment I wanted to ask. And Star, thank you for that. I, I think that really shows that um, we have a lot of work to do in, in all of our parts of our system. And looking at the time, I know we're going to be wrapping up at 5, and I, I think it might be a helpful uh, for the conversation. Robert, if I can ask you to, um, Robert is our scribe, as I've mentioned, and I wanted to ask him if he can kind of read out loud to all of us what he's jotted down or some of the, the short version, shorthand version uh, of the recommendations and things that we can take. Uh, I, I know training is going to be one of them. Um, just on that last comment, if we can go to uh, Robert and then I know uh, Jeremy from Yakima and then Natalia have a comment as well. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, I'm gonna kind of try to do this not comprehensively, because you can imagine there was a lot that's been discussed over the last couple of hours. But I'm going to hit some of the highlights and the categorizations. For each of the four groups that are going on today, the intent is to have a readout tomorrow that is based on four fundamental sections. One is, what are tribal areas of concern that can be addressed within the current powers of the governance cabinet? So things that we can execute on within the frameworks we have today. We talked about a lot of those. Some of the jurisdictional issues seems like they can be sorted out that way, the cooperation, et cetera. Areas that require legislative action, right, is the second category. And I think the uh, representative did a great job of outlining a series of those, although admittedly some of those may not require legislative action. This is a you know, hypothesis for action we're trying to develop here. And then to begin to formulate what a state tribal opioid response partnership looks like. And the fourth one is recommendations for institutional systemic change to be brought to the governor. I think between the latter two is where a lot of the issues that, um, you know, people expressed a lot of frustration around funding levels, availability. I think, you know, diversion programs, detox centers, the availability to uh, treat people within the prison or the jail system is a good example. There appear to be good models out there, but the availability, the proximity, the funding for them don't seem to be um, in presence. Um, same earlier today, we heard a lot of testimony about uh, post-release types of issues, um, ensuring transition, um, the availability to go into um, intensive outpatient uh, treatment, um, the ability to find uh, sober housing and have sober housing funded. So all of those areas within the justice seem like um, things that we've discussed today. Um, and, you know, what we'll do overnight is categorize those, you know, around those four categories and try to make sure we've got a good slate of um, all the things that have been discussed today to allow the, uh, to allow the chairs to uh, take that to the governor um, tomorrow. 
Thank you. And, and if there's things that, that we need to rec recommend to the governor tomorrow, um, solutions, things that we want to work to, uh, this is the part of the conversation. If, if you don't get a chance to uh, say it uh, while we're here, um, you know, follow up with Robert uh, if you see him around or, you know, come up offline if you don't want to speak uh, out loud. Uh, but we want to make sure that your recommendations and solutions uh, do get brought forward to the governor and as well as concerns that you may have uh, with anything that we're talking about. I can turn it over to Jeremy next. Yeah. And, and, and then uh, real quick, Nick, on that, you know, um, again, uh, this is just the beginning of the conversations. Uh, you know, we don't need all the solutions now. You know, this is the very beginning. Uh, Aaron walked in, and so I, I think we'll have more discussion as this moves along. We'll have follow-up with the agencies, with tribal leadership, on what does it look like moving forward. And and so don't think if we don't get your comment in, like, like there's, there's more work. This is just the beginning. Um, and, and then also, this is a good setup for... Uh, the national opioid summit taking place in Tulalip. And so I, I know we have our federal partner here, but I mean, there's a lot more that, uh, there's a trust responsibility that someone talked about earlier. And, and so this, there's federal recommendations that, that need to happen. And so these are part of those conversations. And just wanna remind everyone um, that's gonna happen in Tulalip um, in August. Uh, all right, I'll turn over to the Yakima Nation. Thank you, Recovering Councilman Asa. <laughs> so I'm Jeremy Takala. I serve as our, one of the 14 council for Yakima Nation. I serve as our law order chair. And just to share some ideas, you know, for Yakima Nation, you know, we, we have about 11,000 members and, you know, based on the FBI guidance, we should at least have 76 officers to cover our 1.4 million acres and all that includes on reservation, but we also have, you know, trust allotments down in the Klickitat um, County. Uh, we also do have uh, some, you know, up, upper river fishery that occurs, and we have a, a bison hunt that takes place over in Montana. So you can see we're, we're spread thin, you know, when it comes to our, our officers, fish and game and public safety. But <clears throat> I think overall, you know, I, I heard, you know, what, what are the solutions that we can, how, how can we work together and find solutions to have increased resources and, I know Nick, you were present, you know, back in D.C., and I know Chairman Erickson from Colville was present when we provided a testimony in the subcommittee appropriation. I think, I think, you know, I believe for tribes, that's where it needs to start at the top. Um, you know, we've been flat funded for at least two decades. You know, when it comes to 638 contracts, and um, you know, we we were actually. I appreciate uh, Chief Batista trying to offer jobs to our our officers here, but. <laughs> <laughs> we were actually losing officers to uh, city departments and uh, uh, Commissioner Shike's buddy, uh, Sheriff Udell at Yakima County, and it, it was a struggle, you know, and I'm, I think that's a struggle overall we're all seeing is losing officers to different departments because of the competitive, and, and not only that, they're shorthanded. But I think overall, you know, and I'm sure the prosecutor can agree, you guys are shorthanded too when it comes to your guys' uh, um, work area. You know, I know working with Yakima County, um, we had a roundtable discussion with Congressman Newhouse on the fentanyl crisis where uh, Nick had mentioned the legislation that was, you know, trying to be introduced by Newhouse, which is real, really, really strong. Saying, look, this sounds really good and all, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, you know, including what I heard was services, uh, preventative measures. And from that, that conversation there, it, it's leading into, you know, a follow-up with Congressman Newhouse on, you know, a task force team and including all of those all of those areas, including you know uh, the the county commissioners, the tribal uh, police, the uh, county sheriffs, and city departments, and I think you know we're at that moment where we know we know it is a public crisis, and I think you know we talk about jurisdiction issues, you know we we still deal with that every now and then. We we work well with uh, Yakima County, um, but we still have one county that refuses to work with Yakima Nation. We also have a few city departments that refuse to work with Yakima Nation, and it's always, and I appreciate that, the case by case, because we work with the Eastern side, but it's frustrating where they're not consistent when it comes to working with the, our, our tribal prosecutor. Um, you know, homicides, you know, shoot-ins, and you know, I, I hope that's something, an area that where we can work together on, because it's frustrating when, you know, BIA statute says you can only hold this individual 
one year per, you know, based on each crime, you know, when we feel like the prosecutor should be taking this case upon, you know, federally. Um, but I think, you know, institutionalize everyone, you know, under understanding the tribes, you know, when it comes for their, their own governance and the laws that they have in place. Uh, but <clears throat> I think, you know, the message to, you know, our governor is to, of course, support the tribes and with respect to their sovereignty, but, you know, uh, working together because Yakima Nation, we have a very diverse community. Um, for a while, you know, and, and we, we have agreement with the state troopers, you know, on, you know, after retrocessor was really, you know, it was, it was difficult, but we, we need to have those conversations to come together because it's not just the tribal communities on a reservation, it includes non-tribal as well, and they need your guys' services there as well. And so we've, we've come together, we've met with, you know, the Washington State Troopers Union, and we've had that agreement. I was just telling Commissioner Scheich that we need to update that MOU, you know, at some point. But, you know, see, those type of relationships can work, and I recommend that for the tribes to talk to your county commissioners, talk to your, your county, talk to your congressional leaders, um, you know, we've always also, also submitted, you know, some requests in Senator Cantwell's uh, proposals as well, and we're, we're working hard on that, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a public crisis, it is, but, uh, you know, you talk about in, increased resources, well, let's, you know, let's narrow it down to the fentanyl and opioid crisis, because that's where the resources are needed. Preventable, preventative measures, we also need uh, services that are readily available. Uh, I think, like Commissioner Scheich mentioned earlier, is is just communication, and let's not forget about you know our officers, because I my concern is when they get exposed, you know, to those things, not knowing what they're going to be approaching upon. I hate to have you know Jimmy here or our officers go home and bring that back to their family. That's that's my biggest concern because we can't afford to lose any officers. You know, they need to be out there for you know the protections of our our communities. So. Um, I hope I don't forget anything, uh, forget anything, you know, this this is one of the hats that I wear as tribal, tribal leaders and I'm sure many of you guys do the same thing, you know, it's, 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 it's there's a lot of things going on, but those are the things that I just want to mention that uh, Yakima Nation is working on, so uh, thank you. Thank you, I see Natalia and then Gary. First, I want to say I'm going to stay seated because this is traumatizing for me. Um, <clears throat> I said, been a few years ago. We have we didn't have uh, uh, an agreement with Whatcom County sheriffs to come onto the reservation. Um, and we were it's just just after the Fourth of July. We had some fireworks left over. Uh, one of my, we were celebrating a birthday as well. And one of my family members looked out the window and said, there's police officers outside. There looks like Whatcom County and they've got dogs with them. And so I went outside to see what was going on. And our whole play area was surrounded by 12 Whatcom County sheriffs. And I asked them what they, what was going on. They all had their guns, <clears throat> and they had their guns pointed at us. <clears throat> and what, what was happening was, um, one of the girlfriends of one of my grandsons had stolen a saddle from her aunt. My grandson had her phone. So they pinged her phone, and they assumed she was at my house. She wasn't. And I told them repeatedly, she is not here. And, um, <clears throat> and my grand I told my grandson to get go back in the house, because I was afraid they were going to drag him into jail, you know, and, and he had nothing to do with it. And so he went back in the house, and they kept telling saying they wanted him to come out, and I said, no, you stay in the house. And so <clears throat> uh, my, one of my other grandsons came out into the yard and got attacked by the by that dog and uh, tore him open. And, <clears throat> and like I said, we were having a birthday party. There was, there was eight of us there, 
and some of them were real young children. My, um, one of my great granddaughters at the time was just a little child. She's 22 years old now, and she's still traumatized from this. We all are. You know, if you had 12 guns pointed at you, you know, you'd be traumatized for a while too. And I refused to let him in the house. I said, you need to call Lummi Law and Order. You don't have a right to be here without Lummi Law and Order here. And, and they kept saying, you know, no, we're not calling Lummi Law and Order. We have a right to be here. And we're going in the house. And I said, no, you're not going in the house. And I kept insisting that they were not going in the house. And finally, I, after they had us, they had us there for about an hour with these guns pointing at us, threatening us, threatening to come in and, and uh, tear up my furniture, tear the walls out of my, the plasterboard and the walls out of, uh, cut them up. And, and, uh, and I still kept saying, no, you're not going in without Lummi Law and Order. And, uh, and, it, and I uh, finally yelled at my grandson in the house and I said, call Lummi Law and Order. They wouldn't call Lummi Law and Order. So I told him, call Lummi Law and Order. He did. And Lummi Law and Order come out. <clears throat> and I said, told them, you know, you can go in the house. Lummi Law and Order, you can go in the house and look. You can look everywhere, you know, for her. She's not here. And uh, Whatcom County sheriffs insisted they had to go in the house, too. And I said, no, I'm not giving you permission to go in the house. I said, you don't have permission to be here. And so two Lummi officers went in, went through the house, searched the basement, searched, searched the main floor, searched upstairs, looked in all the closets and everything, and no, she wasn't there. You know, but uh, so I'm just, what I'm saying is, if you ever think of a cross country or cross county jurisdiction, look at it very carefully and make sure that this doesn't happen to anybody else, you know. Um, it was very traumatizing for my family, for all my family. We still talk about it every once in a while, you know. And um, I, I hope to God this doesn't ever happen to anybody, you know. But, and, and for them to say that they were going to cut up my furniture, cut up the walls in my house, burn the house down, you know, and they were threatening me every way that they could, and I just stood my ground and saying, no, you're not going in. Firecracker went out because my daughter backed up and, and her foot hit a firecracker that was on a, one of those little ones, you know, that you step on and they pop. Three guns went like this, pointing at her. I thought she was a dead, dead person right there. You know, those kinds of things. It should never have happened. So I just want you guys to really think really hard if you're looking at cross-jurisdiction. Make sure that there's something in there for the protection of our people. I want to say thank you, Natalia. And as we talk about this, I think that's important. And that would go for any conversation. As we talk about solutions, we also have to acknowledge the harm and the trauma in the past we don't want none of that to ever happen again. And so I do agree with you, Natalia, that as we go down these roads of trying to work on solutions, we do have to make sure that we're not causing un unintended harm. I know that's something that we've heard a couple of times that when we pass legislation, we always have to go back and look at fixes for things that we might not have, have thought of as the bill or the, the policies were being formed. And so I appreciate your reminder uh, about how we can do this in a better way and uh, I know we got a lot of room for improvement. I just want to let you know your, your story, your voice mattered, and it didn't fall on deaf ears. Thank you. Gary. I just want to leave everybody with a thought as, as we work this. Thank you, Natalia, for bringing that up, because that is very, very important. As one of our tribal elders, we, you know, we have a lot of respect for you and all the work that you've done in, for Lummi, and um, I appreciate that. And that kind of goes along with what I want to, to, to the thought that I want to leave you with is as we move forward, just remember relationships are a lot. They mean a lot. My friend Jimmy Shikes here, I've known him for years. 
worked with him on you know, a lot of things. So it's good to see him. Good to see you, my friend. Um, I never forget those. Never forget those. And I want to leave it with another thought is we as Native people need to take care of each other. It's okay to develop relationships with outside jurisdictions, but remember, we're the ones that have to take care of each other. And I really encourage the, you know, the Tulalips and the Lummies and the, you know, the Nooksacks, Yakimas, all get together and put that NADO back together, the Native American Tribal Enforcement Officers Association. Put that back together. There was a lot of good work that went through there, and we took care of each other because nobody else was going to. But it also put our, good, our best foot forward and say we're willing to work with you as tribes. Yep, with uh, Lummi Law and Order in the tribe and trying to do what we can for public safety, um, both tribal and non-tribal members that are out um, on the Lummi Nation. So, and, and I am committed to continue to do that, uh, whether it's trying to address the, the fentanyl epidemic that is uh, taking far too many people from all our communities, uh, but also the other, the other um, crimes and activity that, that impacts our community on a daily basis. So it's in all our best interest to work together um, as one. So thank you. Thank you very much. Justine, we have a hand up in the, in the back again. Thank you. With her. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge your thoughts also. I know I think some of us have experienced that from our own tribal police. Um, things like that sometimes you know I heard earlier there's some people that need to get out of this business and I think that's true um, and I think that's happening over time but one thing historically I think tribes are right now suffering in the I know I talked about the job sh the shortage but a couple of things I wanted to just revisit on that you talked about the retirement the mass retirement historically a lot of tribes have been able to hire some people who retire out of other law enforcement agencies to help fill some of our gaps for a couple years. Now those people are just retiring and not working anymore at all. So that pool or that mass retirement is hurting us even more because they're retiring if they're long-term tribal cops and they're, when they're retiring from other agencies, they're not looking for a second job for a couple years. So I know um, at least at Swinomish, we filled in you know, some of our vacancies that way. Sometimes we'd get a retiree from, from somewhere else that wanted to work a couple more years in maybe a, a smaller place. They're just not doing that anymore. So I think that's, that's a huge difference ch hit for us now too. Um, but I know you're going to meet the governor tomorrow and I don't know what the exact solutions or asks are going to be, but one of the things that's been hitting my mind kind of throughout this afternoon, one of the other struggles that we've really had in our recruiting situation, and I think you referenced it over here earlier, is competing with other agencies, right? Like everybody's trying to recruit the same people. And when different jurisdictions are offering really big bonus payments, um, we can't compete with that. It gives a bonus to anybody who goes into law enforcement business anywhere in our state for any jurisdiction, tribal or non, and try to equalize that a little bit because we just don't have the extra budget to be paying overtime to our officers who are working, plus paying bonuses to people coming on, plus the morale issue that causes. If we start giving big hiring bonuses, what do we do with our guys who've been working 100 hours a week to fill the gap for two years while we did that? So, I don't know, just thoughts. The, but competing with the hiring bonuses is a real struggle. Thank you for that. And, and there's a lot of truth in that. It, I, I've heard it in our community as well. And so I want to say thank you for recognizing that and echoing uh, those comments. It, it means a lot to hear from others as well. Yeah, we, you know, um, it, it's kind of funny. I had prior to, uh, at one point I, had, I worked at a casino uh, out in Yakima, at Legends Casino. And we, and we had a, I worked in HR, and we, we kind of had like a mini funnel going on. Uh, we had security guards coming in at entry level, security for, for the casino property. They'd get the basic training for a while, and then they'd, and we have a department of corrections. So they'd go to DOC, get a pay raise. Then they'd be there for a while. And then at some point, they would, all right, I'm ready. And they'd, they'd try to be a police officer, go to training, you know? And so it's like, it's like a mini funnel. Almost like a farm system, I guess, from security, you know, 
out of high school job going on. And so that's maybe something to think about as well. A um, couple of thoughts as, as we close. You know, uh, we, you know, we talk about the Blake fix all day. Um, that's a state law. You know, I, I, I think tribes, um, uh, you know, can, can be creative with their own, uh, their own codes when it comes to enforcement of, you know, opioids and fentanyl on the reservation. And so really take a deep dive on your tribe codes and then how that, how you can manage it that way, you know. Um, and then last thing, uh, again, just want to reiterate from A.G. Ferguson's remarks earlier, um, uh, they passed the budget last week. There's $15 million uh, that's available for tribes. Um, and I, I think that's through HCA. They're going to do grants. And so, uh, so that's specific for tribes, but that doesn't mean you're only limited to the, those funds. Uh, really, tribes and tribal leadership need to work with their city and counties to really, how can you strengthen uh, and, 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 and using those funds collectively? And, and so that's, you know, there's all this funds available. Um, and so I really encourage leadership to reach out to your city, your county elected folks, and how can you partner together? Um, and so those, those are some things. And then uh, kind of wrapping up, uh, we'll, we'll huddle afterwards, our Luke, Nick and myself and the, um, our team here, we'll huddle up uh, tomorrow. We'll do a recap with the larger group, and, and then we'll kind of go into the, the solutions uh, w with everyone else. And so that's kind of like what things look like next. Moving forward. Thank you very much, Asa. Um, as Chief Batista, you know, you've had a very uh, a good, productive listening and speaking day today. There's a lot of discussions when we're talking about a lot of these things. Uh, these are not easy conversations. Um, you know, there's a, a lot more need than there are resources, it feels, at times. But, you know, following on Asa's comment, how can we strengthen the resources that we do have? Uh, to our advantage, uh, working together, building the communication, uh, treating each other as equals and partners uh, goes a long way. And I'm just wondering, as we close, begin to close, if you have any th closing thoughts on the day. Well, again, I want to thank you and I want to thank the Lummies for hosting this. Uh, this has been very, very... Uh, inspiring to me and uh, to my personnel. It's been very educational. Uh, the important thing is realizing that we, we are where we are. This is a starting point. And the conversations that we've had today are absolutely beneficial. So your voices uh, have been heard and they've, uh, they mean something to me and my staff. Hopefully they mean something to all of us. I'm sure they do. But again, this is the start of it. There's a lot more conversation to be had. The problems that we're facing with fentanyl and a whole host of issues, they aren't going to be solved overnight. Unfortunately, they built up over time, and it's going to take time and resources in order to get to where we want to be. But it all begins with, uh, it's no different than family, my household. If we have a disagreement, uh, I make sure my wife knows that she's always right. But importantly, it's about a conversation, having a conversation and being open and honest about our feelings and our views. We don't have to agree, always agree with one another, but we need to have the dialogue. And I think that's been very healthy today, is to have the dialogue, is to be really honest about what we've experienced, your input, uh, very meaningful. Uh, that's feedback that we need to hear. And so the sheriff appreciates that, I appreciate that. Uh, it helps us get to where we need to be, which is a better position in order to be able to humbly and properly serve uh, each other. So again, I thank you for uh, being here. And any future conversations that you want to have uh, involving my folks, I want to be a part of that. I want to make sure that my captain, who runs each of the district, uh, the 39 counties, we have eight districts, they're all run by captains. And when we talk about uh, you know, attitudes and so forth that are unproductive on the streets, that's unacceptable. We need to know about that so we can ensure that we have the facts and we can make sure our people understand our expectations and that they are there to deliver on those expectations. So again, I want to be a part of future conversations, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, law enforcement and public safety. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Conversations that lead to solutions. We'll be looking forward to those. Uh, I want to do one last call for anyone that's here before I ask our panelists for any closing thoughts and check.
Okay. Right, any of our panelists up here have any thoughts? Well, I guess from from a tribal prosecutor's perspective, I've been doing this work for Tilda for eight years now, and the, the jurisdictional complexity is something my team deals with every day, and it makes the job, which is it's, it's already a hard job. How do you do justice in a with crimes of addiction um, when you add the jurisdictional complexity of Indian country and the resource constraints, and it's it's a really hard job. But I'm I'm really heartened to have just to see, be part of the conversation, see all these people coming from all, all the different tribes and from the state, and I'm really excited to see where the conversation goes. As a tribal chief of police, I just wanna thank uh, those that organized this event. I've been listening to your input and taking a lot of mental notes, and I can't wait for tomorrow so we can start talking about solutions. It's a real honor to be here, and uh, and we know that we're not gonna arrest our way out of a fentanyl epidemic in our country. But I can tell you, I do believe Indian country is many times more disparately impacted by this epidemic. And I'm here today because we're really tired of going to death overdose calls and funerals of tribal members. And we're dealing with highly organized crime, smuggling this onto the reservations and we're looking for any tools we can get to really uh, attack and uh, disrupt the, uh, the drug smuggling onto the reservation. And then for the uh, folks that are suffering with addiction, we're all for education, prevention, intervention, and treatment. Uh, but I hope that we can also talk about some strategies for those that are profiting off marketing death to tribal members and, and in our communities. So. Looking forward to further conversation. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank you for having me, and I also just wanted to let you know that I have a running list of everything I need to talk to Nick Brown, our U.S. attorney, as well as our tribal liaison who is unable to be here today. Uh, and we're hoping that we can further assist, assist more in this um, issue that's impacting the tribal communities. Uh, I know that as a prosecutor for several years before I came in AUSA, um, I am excited to take on a lot of these cases to work with many of you um, and hopeful that we can um, help take a dent out of this problem. I'd like to thank you all for having me. Uh, as I said in the beginning, um, I'm humbled to be part of this. I, I, uh, you know, I'm, I work with our local task force. I, I recognize the dangers of fentanyl. I can tell you that last year, the Whatcom County Ta Drug Task Force pulled 55,000 55, pills and 12,000 grams of powder. This is all fentanyl. Uh, from our streets and um, I, you know I appreciate the discussion that we heard from the chief about supporting our task force in the future but I know I know this is not just a criminal justice issue this is more than that this is public health and um, I, I'm supportive of all of those efforts as well thank you again yeah also honored and humbled to be here um, you know at this time where you know, this epidemic is, is causing so much harm to uh, our communities and just killing people. Um, I think it was Nick this morning who, who encouraged uh, state representatives to listen and learn today. And I just wanted to, to assure you that I've been listening and learning all day as I know that my fellow uh, representatives in state government have um, that will be talking about this internally at the Attorney General's office. And looking forward tomorrow to discussing potential solutions to the issues that we've identified today. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I guess my last comment, you know, there's, there's some other tracks that, that uh, are having important discussions just like this was. You know, this one was focused on a tool and a resource to address the fentanyl crisis in all of our communities. But as we hear from all of our law enforcement, even our law enforcement says we can't arrest our way out of this. That means a lot to me. Our officers know that this really is a mental health issue. This is about addressing the disease, the addiction. And I wanna say thank you for coming to this space with an open heart and an open mind and sharing your stories. 
sharing your truth, helping us with solutions and recommendations. They are going to help change or improve the system that we see in our communities today. From everybody that we've talked with, whether on the tribal side or the state side or the federal side, I've always heard in these conversations, we want to take what we're hearing from all of the conversations and work on how we can implement solutions. And it means a lot that when we sit together at this table and we wear different hats and come from different places, different worlds, that we all have the same goal and we wanna to work towards the same thing. And that is a healthy, happy, thriving community that all of our families and loved ones deserve. So I wanna say thank you for being here, for being who you are. You help make this world a better place by the work that you do. And I want you to never forget that. To our law enforcement, I know you guys don't hear it enough as well, but as I said earlier in just a brief comment, when people run away from danger, you guys run to it. And I've talked with some of our law enforcement. And when we can acknowledge and we hear the stories, we're seeing younger and younger people die. We've seen a three-month-old die in our community. We've heard about a five-year-old die in our community. Also, we've had a 14-year-old die in, in the community, not, not Lummi, but in, in this area, who overdosed in the bathroom at school. And our first responders are always going to those things. And they don't do enough to take care of themselves. I've talked with some of our law enforcement officers that respond, and especially if you have a child, and you have to respond to an innocent child that just died from something that they had no business being around. You take that trauma back, and then we expect you to show up the next day, like nothing happened. And so I wanna say thank you for doing the work that you do. You don't hear that enough. You see things, and you carry them with you, and you keep going. And so I want you to know that you're appreciated and I appreciate the value and the love that you bring to the work that you do. You are helping humanize a conversation that we need desperately right now in this country. And so thank you. That does conclude our, our session. Um, I hope that everybody can join us for Culture Night, uh, the, the community building, the address is on the flyer. Uh, Asa has spent months working on his outfit. He's gonna do a cultural dance hey. for everybody. Yeah. But, uh, that is at 6.30, our culture night. Yeah. We do hope that you can join us. Uh, we have seafood. Our youth have been working all day on, on what they're going to do. Uh, it'll be a beautiful place, and it'll be even beautifuler with your presence. And I hope you can join us. Asa, yeah. any comments? Yeah. yeah, so again, thank you. Really great panel. Let's give a round of for our panel. They did a great job today. <laughs> Nick did a great job facilitating. Really good work. Oh yeah, so 6.30, uh, Culture Night, I know it's a long day, we talk about some heavy stuff, come and hang out with the kids and eat seafood, you know? Now you can take your bow tie off, you know? Like, we can relax. All right, thank you. <laughs>